we're going to begin in about three minutes. Well, I guess precisely three minutes. So if everyone can start taking their seats and finding their place. We're going live on camera on the internet, so. Wow, we got a packed house today. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> you know, before we actually start, let's take care of some battery business. Just so you know, this is a very exclusive club. So um, there are no phones. You can't make phone calls, and uh, there are no pictures beyond this room. So if you're going to take all your selfies, do them in here. And if anybody has any problems with anything or they need any help, look for Samira. She's the gorgeous woman in the white suit from EIT. She's not in the room now, but she's hard to miss. <laughs> Still have a few people coming in, so we'll just let them come in. You can chatter for the next two minutes if you like or just awkwardly stare at me. I'm cool with that, too. <laughs> it's a good suit I'm wearing today, so. Yeah. All right, looks like we got all our friends coming in. A couple stragglers back there. We can make room. All right, are you guys ready to get started? Yes. Are you amped? Yes. I have a feeling that Europeans are like engineers. I'm gonna have to party a little bit here. <laughs> okay, we got this. That's Samira back there, the woman I was speaking of. She's the one, if you have any issues, raise your hands, hello. Go to her. She can solve any problem. Not personal ones, please don't do that. All right, so welcome to the first European Innovation Agora in Silicon Valley. Woo! All right, so how many of you have traveled a long distance and are ready to be intellectually stimulated out of jet lag? Raise your hand. All right, we're going to need to work here. All right, so how many, where are my locals at? Where are my valley people? Yeah, yeah, all right, so I grew up here, so I am very aware of all of the magical iterations of this place. I was born and raised on tech. I grew up in the same town that Steve Wozniak raised his kids, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a lifer in this valley. Um, I can kind of tell who the locals are. I gotta say, one thing that's never changed is the tech vest. If you walk around town, you wanna see who a local is, look for a fleece vest with some sort of possibly shut down amazing adventure <laughs> labeled on the vest. So my name is Carrie Byron and I am your master of ceremonies today. I've had a lot of job titles, but I gotta say I really like master, it's good. I'm looking for overlord next, if anybody can figure out how I get that on a business card. All right, my first and most paramount title though was that of Mythbuster. Um, I don't know if you've seen that show, it's in almost every country, but you could say that that is my origin story. Uh, I was a presenter on Discovery Channel's reality-based science show, Mythbusters. We tested the plausibility of urban, le urban legends and with the scientific method. It was a groundbreaking show, and it established a lifetime for me of an incredible career and advocacy of STEM, and of course, it created my love of science, tech, and engineering. If you're familiar with STEM, you notice I left off the M. I still don't really like math. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'll get there. Engineers can help me, thank God for calculators. So as my role as a Mythbuster and a TV personality, I've been asked to do a couple of crazy things in my 20 years. I have been asked to eat live bugs, donate every single body fluid, including flatulence, don't ask how we collected, was locked in a coffin with 50 scorpions, attacked by a police dog while covered in wolf urine, dove with sharks at night in baited water with only a flashlight. I've crashed cars, 
semi trucks jumped from a 100 story building out of planes, wired explosives at heights, been forced unconscious by a jet fighter, uh, fired a Gatling gun in a secret location with an arms dealer, <laughs> taunted an alligator with a raw chicken by hand, stopped a moving truck with a 50 caliber sniper, my favorite shot ever, been blindfolded on a roller coaster, implanted with an RFID chip. Yeah, in my arm, I got a barcode. Set off hundreds, uh, hundreds and hundreds of explosives. And I've walked in four inch heels on a red carpet like 10 times. So, you, you know, there's a reason they call me the crash test girl, but I gotta say, none of this prepared me for the thrilling and exciting life as a female founder looking for investment in the dog eat dog world of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. This is exciting. I'm telling you, I'm a co-founder of a company called Explorer, and it's a company that bases in New York City, Minneapolis, Amsterdam, and San Francisco. So I understand what we're talking about here today. Silicon Valley, it's more than a location. In this global age of innovation, it's really a state of mind. We work where we feel inspired, wherever that is, wherever we feel supported. Now, I can tell you, or I trying to tell you for the last three minutes that I am a fierce and formidable woman. Now, let's just say game recognize game. So let's get ready for our keynote speaker, an unstoppable force in European innovation. As the European Commissioner of Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, she's been like a dynamo, powering up the EU with epic programs like the massive 95 billion euro Horizon Europe and the life-changing Aramis Plus. She's also been the driving force behind the pan-European program, Digital Europe, which has further strengthened EU's digital, pro 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 hello, digital presence. Talk about making things go boom but in a very good way. So buckle up, folks, because today you will get the lowdown on the future of European innovation, how we can get involved in the thrilling new European innovation agenda. Let's embark on this wild ride together. So let's give it up right now for our myth-busting, trail-blazing keynote speaker, Maria Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, dear friends of innovation, well, first of all, thank you very much. I think that definitely this day is, is a special day for every one of us because our journey is simply continuing this time in Silicon Valley. But I would like to say since the very beginning that the biggest and most active economic relationship in the world is between the United States and the European Union. And you know, President Biden and the President of the European Commission, von der Leyen, just confirmed this. They also agreed that innovation is the key for solving our shared economic problems and building a resilient, competitive economy for the future. And we share values. Now, on these very first European Innovation Days in the United States, of course, we are here to discuss Europe's efforts in the area of innovation, what it provides for innovators, corporations, and funders. And in Europe, yes, we are building an innovation ecosystem that will allow Europe to spearhead the new wave of deep tech innovation, innovation that will allow us to address our society's deepest challenges, such as energy, health, or food crisis, Innovation that brands hardware, software, and biological components, and that disrupts in the industries that have not been disrupted by startups yet, such as manufacturing, energy, transportation, or the food industry. Europe has all the assets needed to build this innovation ecosystem, and our new European innovation agenda is now turning those assets into business opportunities. And let me tell you about five of those assets. Excellent engineering talent, innovation investment, innovation ecosystems across all Europe, business-friendly regulation, and a strong industrial base. First, 
Europe got talent. They are more than 17 million people in university level education in the EU. We have over a million researchers and Europe has 50% of the top 200 engineering universities of the world. The kind of talent that is needed for deep tech innovation. And building up this knowledge is visible. The European Union is the source of one-fifth of all top quality publications in the world, but excellent science is not turned only into academic papers. 20% of all patent applications that can contribute towards the green transition also originate in the European Union. Our new European innovation agenda and the new European strategy for universities will continue to strengthen these talent base. In the past few months, projects like the European Network of Innovative Higher Education Institutions, university incubators, or innovators at schools have been started to make sure that universities are at the center of the innovation ecosystem. And the European delegation here at the first European Innovation Days in Silicon Valley includes representatives from eight European universities, which I'd like to thank for having come with us. Also, our European Institute of Innovation and Technology will be in charge of training one million people in deep tech fields by 2025. We are supporting innovation internships so our researchers and students can gain business experience in startups. Additionally, a topic very close to my heart, our women entrepreneurship and leadership scheme is assisting early stage women-led tech startups in changing the gender landscape in Europe where men founded 75% of all startups. At the same time, we are open for talent outside Europe. That is why we are launching, and that was our main announcement yesterday, the Deep Tech Talent Platform to help innovators come and work in Europe. The Deep Tech Talent Platform will provide researchers, engineers, and entrepreneurs with information on work, funding, and hosting opportunities, and career development tools across a network of 43 European countries. Together with their rich culture, work-life balance, and social security support, Europe's member states are the ideal place for deep tech talent. Let me turn now to our second asset, innovation investments. Europe has mobilized unprecedented amounts of capital in the past years for investments in startups. After record-breaking levels of 110 billion euros in 2021, Europe remained resilient with a level of 85 billion euros in 2022, despite the toughest macroeconomic environment since the global financial crisis. Recent events at the Silicon Valley Bank show how important it is for startups to have a strong banking system as well. And I want to show all my support and sympathy for the stressful situation that these recent events have generated on many of you. Europe and the US will continue to work together to build an economy that is innovative, competitive, resilient and strong will succeed if we continue working together. And I'm glad to confirm that Europe and US are now at the same level as regard the level of investment in early stage startups and will continue to support access to finance for promising startups in particular in late stage growth. The European Innovation Council our Europe's unicorn factory provides dedicated support for visionary deep tech entrepreneurs in SEED and Series A. 
with a 10 billion euro budget for a seven year period. It has already backed 12 unicorns and 112 centaurs companies and leveraged nearly three euros of private investment for every euro of public money. In addition, it support for over 500 disruptive research projects has led to more than 1,300 innovations. Many of these companies are ready to scale and present highly attractive investment opportunities. And US investors are already recognizing this. San Francisco-based Bessemer Venture Partners invested in elusive networks, a leader in cybersecurity systems supported by the European Innovation Council and now a central company. Similarly, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology supports deep tech startups in seed, but also through equity support in all phases of the growth of the startups. That was the case for Northvolt, the world's greenest battery. Northvolt has not only created the world's cleanest battery, but it also raised $2.8 billion in the single largest funding round by any tech company in Europe in 21. Its market valuation is now above 10 billion euros. So I would like here to say special thank to my leaders from the European Innovation Council, Marc, Jean-David, from the European Institute of Technology, and of course, to say a big thank you to our partner, the European Investment Bank. Now it's true, we want to go further by mobilizing by 25 an additional 45 billion euros of funding for scale-ups from untapped resources of private capital, such as pension and insurance funds, by helping them de-risk in the EU. And our member states are already using too, because we talk only about our budget at the European level, very centralized one, but let's not forget all our member states and the Consul General are with us, and that's a great message. They are already using a significant part of their resilience and recovery funds, worth a total of more than 700 billion euros, allocated in response to the COVID-19 crisis to create ecosystems and financial instruments to support startups, including in deep tech. Now, allow me to move to our third asset, innovation ecosystems across Europe. Europe is the region of the world with the most regional innovation ecosystems. This is part of the DNA of Europe, not leaving any region behind. But we'll not stop here. We'll invest billions of euro to build 100 regional innovation valleys, including regions with lower innovation performance, who will strengthen their innovation ecosystems and deliver inter-regional innovation projects, including deep tech. And we are making rural areas attractive to innovators through our Startup Villages initiative. So if you want to create or scale up a startup in Europe in any region across the EU, including rural regions, you will find emerging and dynamic regional ecosystems welcoming you. And I'm very glad that we have six representatives from all the different corners of Europe with us. You can all enjoy how they simply transfer to you the emotion, the curiosity, and I firmly believe that they will continue to lead by example. Now, we know that talent, financial support, thriving ecosystems for innovation, are not enough to guarantee deep tech innovation. That is why, under the new European innovation agenda, we are strengthening our pro-innovation regulatory framework, our fourth asset. 
innovative technologies often need trials, which are only possible if they are exempted from existing regulations through regulatory sandboxes. This is why just last week, the European Commission adopted the Net Zero Industry Act, which provides for regulatory sandboxes that allow the development, testing and validation of innovative net zero technologies. And in addition, we are also providing guidance to our member states on when and how to use regulatory sandboxes in other deep tech areas, such as agriculture, aerospace, manufacturing, and transportation. We know that deep tech innovation disrupt sectors that are very regulated. This calls for regulators and governments to be part of the innovation ecosystem, not with the intention of creating burdens, but with the purpose of helping startups navigate through the regulations while protect protecting the interests of citizens and, of course, fostering innovation. And we are also helping to make space for experimentation and test beds so that disruptive technologies like hydrogen, hyperloops and precision agriculture can be developed more quickly. And we are making Europe even more appealing to people who want to start a business by changing the rules so that they can keep control after their company goes public. We are also assessing if the rules of, on employee stock options may require amendments to make employee ownership regimes more innovation friendly. Finally, the new wave of deep tech innovation requires the inclusion of industry from the outset. The industry in Europe is our fifth asset. Deep tech startups, in contrast to their digital counterparts, must collaborate closely with established businesses from the beginning. For the best chances of success, of success for both deep tech startups and established industry, the venture client model developed in Germany has shown excellent results. And I'm happy to see that 11 high-level executives of European industries have accompanied us in this mission to Silicon Valley. To conclude, I'd like to point out that deep tech innovation needs everyone involved in innovation, from startups to governments, universities, industry, investors, regions, to work together. Because of this, we backed the creation of our coalition of the willing and the European sounding board. And I want here to thank the chair of the coalition of the winning, dear Jan, for all your efforts. I'm sure that definitely together with you and the entire community, we can show how because we were able to co-create the new European innovation agenda, we'll continue successfully to co-implement it. So I hope you can now see how the new European innovation agenda, which looks to the future, has given Europe the tools it needs to make sure that the next wave of innovation will solve the most difficult problems in our society. But we don't want to do this by ourselves. We need your close collaboration as reliable partners to carry out the 25 actions of the agenda. So that's why the next sessions of the European Innovation Agora will provide concrete avenues for this collaboration. Now, I would like to continue inviting you to be part of this common journey. And of course, I encourage you to make the most of this Agora to continue working together. Thank you.
there's one more major asset that the EU has, and that's you, Maria Gabrielle. Absolutely. So thank you very much. That was really inspiring. And I would like to keep this party started. Uh, the next speaker, Christian Boussois, is the chairman of the IR, or ITRE Committee of the European Parliament EU. I would like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished audience. Uh, I'm honored to be here at the invitation uh, of Commissioner Maria Gabriel, a real champion for research and innovation in Europe, uh, to the very first European Innovation Days in the United States, uh, the perfect place, uh, Silicon Valley. When uh, uh, Maria told me about this event, I was glad to accompany her, join her for calling uh, to attract talents and increase investments in Europe, share best practices among senior executives in open innovation and venture capital, and bridge the gap between two ecosystems in order to strengthen European way forward. I strongly believe that European Union and United States share research values of openness, transparency, fairness, ins inclusiveness, academic freedom and ethics, and are natural partners in science, technology, and innovation. As I already mentioned yesterday, United States has had the highest level of participation in EU research and innovation programs of all non-EU and non-associated countries for many years. And EU-US researchers and innovators are welcome to team up with European counterparts in all European programs. As also I found out during these days, European is also very present in the United States, and especially in Silicon Valley. I saw many European companies and also startups, scale-ups, being present here and being part of the United States ecosystem. I represent Romania and European Parliament, and I'm the chair of Industry, Research, and Energy Committee. And as the title presented very well, one of the main remits of the committee that I represent is research, and of course, research, innovation, and development. These past years, the Union has, has made significant efforts to boost research in the Union. With less than 7% of the global population, the EU accounts for almost 20% of global investment in research and innovation. However, despite the well-known correlation between research, development, innovation, and competitiveness, when it comes to r &I expenditure as a percentage of GDP, we know that the Union still has to learn. And what is happening in the United States, and especially what is a reality here in Silicon Valley, could be a, could be a good source of inspiration also for our future actions and programs. Because we, we still need to reduce the current fragmentation of the European innovation ecosystem, which harms the ability of innovators, especially startups and SMEs, to exploit supports and opportunities. Commissioner Maria Gabriel explained very well the steps that the Union has made and also the plans for the near future. I'm also proud to say that European Parliament and ITRE Committee especially has contributed to boost programs and the financial envelopes at the same time reducing administrative burdens and promoting the concept of open science and with, your, with our initiatives and also amendments, we tried not only to support the very good initiatives of European Commission, but also to improve the uh, proposals. And I'll give you shortly, and in the end of my introduction, just a few concrete examples. For instance, we fought together with the European Commission, with the member states sometime, to have a very good budget for Horizon Europe, the EPIC program, as it was rightly described by our uh, host at the beginning. And this epic program of 95 billion euros strengthens science and technology, fosters industrial competitiveness, aims to implement sustainable development goals in the EU. The missions under Horizon Europe are, toward, are targeted towards areas like fighting cancer, adapting to climate change, protecting the oceans, living in greener cities, and ensuring soil health and food. EU missions contribute to the goals of European Green Deal, 
Europe's beating cancer plan as well as sustainable development goals. Also, our committee adopted the implementation report on the European Innovation Council, a very good initiative of European Union. This was adopted in plenary in November 2022. ITRE committee also backed in 2021 the overall mission of European Institute of Innovation and Technology. In 2021, we voted in ITRE committee the new European partnership between the European Union, member states, and the industry on the 10 these European partnerships. Also, we supported the European Research Area for Strategic Objectives, responding to European Commission with an oral question with resolution. In May 2021, we adopted a report on European High Performance Computing Joint Undertaking, and our amendments, I think, improved and clarified many of the aspects in this uh, initiative. We also supported European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority uh, establishment, HERA, who could be also very much inspired by BARDA in the United States. And we, with this, we ensured the development, production, and the distribution of medicine, vaccines, and related artifacts. And we'd be better prepared for future, I hope it will not be the case, but if it will be for future uh, pandemics. Finally, we also backed and supported the Euro new European Bauhaus uh, uh, concept, and we just adopted the INI report in the European Parliament together with the CALT Committee. These two days, we are putting one more stone to support collaborative research between the United States and the Union, and also to attract investments in the area of innovation. I believe that together with our strategic partner, United States of America. Uh, we are uh, together seeking to expand the union's lead in research. And together, we could really become the world leaders into fighting, into fighting climate change, also using the opportunity of digitalization, of artificial intelligence, of high, five, 6G, of uh, cloud, uh, computer, and also, surely, creating together a better living environment for citizens, in the same time, remaining competitive in the global arena. Thank you so much. Thank you, I'm convinced. <laughs> All right, so to start off this conversation, our first panel is the European Union's presence in Silicon Valley. And I would love to welcome to the stage our moderator, Marco Marinucci, the CEO of MindBridge USA, and he will introduce all of our speakers today. So Marco, I see you've adopted the tech vest. You caught me. Clearly, you caught me. see, you caught me. he's ready to bridge the gap. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I am local, but in my defense, I might say that my venture is still working, yeah. it's still going, so that's the, that's the positive side of it. Yes, Marco Marinucci, European, born in Italy and moved here as many of us a uh, good uh, 20 plus years ago. So my objective in the next 15 minutes is to make sense of the data that are in the reports that is probably by now sitting in your laps or somewhere under your chair. Uh, to do that, let me call on stage also uh, two of the outposts of innovations uh, from Europe that, will, that are representing this data, so please, uh, welcome uh, uh, Clara Andreoletti, CEO of uh, NINEX, please. Hi, Clara. <laughs> and Federico Mena, CEO of EIT Digital. Welcome. <laughs> yes, they sound a little Italian, but they're not really <laughs> Italian about it. All right, so um, the, what I'm going to talk about today is just a very high level. Um, highlights of uh, some of the data that has been gathering, that we've been gathering for a few years. As Mind the Bridge, we work at intersection between uh, startups and uh, corporates and the support ecosystem of innovations around the world. Obviously, in Silicon Valley, is uh, one of the core innovation ecosystem that we've been following and acting. We have uh, our headquarters is here in San Francisco, but we are very European also by nature, and only by nature. So uh, some data I'm gonna share is also related to 
just also the growth of the presence of the European uh, innovation um, um, uh, activities in Silicon Valley. And you, all of that can be downloaded there. Way to take a picture is because the last uh, slide I'm going to show, there is a QR code, so it's probably easier for you to download. So first data point that I'm going to talk about, uh, considering the different implications of innovations and the European presence here, it's hard to slice and dice in different ways, but at least at a high level, what we count here is a 214 scale-ups. Our definition totally subjective of scale-ups are startups are a little bit more mature. And for us, more mature means they have raised at least $1 million in funding. Can be a lot, can be not that much. $1 million fund is what we decided to cut the noise of all the early stage startups. We also have 70 corporates that have an outpost here. We're going to see a little bit more details about that. Uh, we have uh, 24 consulates, uh, that some of them actually here, are very, very connected uh, in a very positive way. And we also have connected to those what we call trade organizations, trade and, uh, and bridge organization. Those are entities that work sometimes with the government organizations, sometimes are independent, but whose focus is really to support innovation, inbound and outbound. So that's what we're counting in, in this number. Now, this is one of probably of the best news of the data point that we gather uh, out of this uh, report. One of the long conversations, especially for people living here for a long time, and also for people working uh, within the ecosystem of Europe, is to avoid or to, to, to control or to have a sense of how is the flow of uh, startups that have to move to Silicon Valley to grow faster, right? to grow uh, as a scale up. And so that flow overall uh, is diminished, so is, uh, is slowing down. So those are numbers, I don't know if you can see in the screen, is pretty small, but basically the top line that it matters is that the, uh, those startups that have both uh, a, a headquarters here and the development side back in Europe has moved down from 4.5% to 2.2%. Each country has kind of their own uh, specific data point. Again, it's not perfect, but it gives you a good sense of uh, how is that flow of entity that have to move here to find more capital. And I think the commissioner mentioned pretty clearly, this is one of the topic uh, of the new agenda of the European Commission. Now back to numbers, those are uh, details more of the European corporate's presence here. And again, been living here a long time, one of the inflow that we're seeing more and more is less of the startups actually getting started here, but it's more of other entities, in particular corporates, that want to stay closer to innovation and so this inflow is really accelerated by uh, quite a bit. We'll see some data about this. And the implementation of their presence can have different shapes and forms. Uh, those are the four that we recognize. We call the uh, innovation antenna, one or two people in co-working spaces, or also here. Uh, innovation labs are entities a little bit bigger, like 10, 10 20 people that are working on a, on a POC, integrating some of the local product. The next step over is a big R&D center, right? So those are typically activities that happened and started 20, 30, 40 years ago. They're now less uh, of, uh, of, of presence here, but it's still a pretty significant presence here. You see uh, 21. The last one that is kind of incrementing, though, is the number of CVC, the corporate venture capital. So the parts of, a, of a corporates that want to come here to invest, co-invest with local investors as well. Uh, one of the interesting points that I was mentioning before is this flow is actually accelerating now. So if you see that curve that goes up and to the right with different colors coding, the gray one is the CVC and so forth. But you get a sense that from 2016 to now, this is definitely accelerating in presence. And again, we have two um, examples here on a stage uh, with us that we'll share in a second. Where are they? Where are they? Again, uh, a lot of logos here, uh, small. Uh, those are, by the way, we are considering for this uh, research, I should have mentioned it, just the larger corporates, so the, the Forbes 2000, Fortune 500. And here you can see how spread out they are between uh, the whole Bay Area, not just in San Francisco, but uh, all across. M many logos that you can recognize. I'm going to finish with this uh, uh, chart here because one of the things, again, there's plenty more data. I don't want to bother you too much about this. But what I, I want to mention is that uh, we've been creating for quite some time, actually, some interactive um, uh, directories. So each of you can go and find who is where, you know, the CVC of that specific industry, where can I find it, where, where is their office, who is the person of uh, contact. So really try to, again, create bridges 
between, between those entities. So those um, uh, files and those directors are open to everybody. I'm going to finish to, with the uh, barcode. Oh, now it's time to take a picture. With a barcode of where you can download uh, the, um, those reports and also uh, having access to all these directors. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm done here. So what I would like to, um, uh, you know, we have probably a few minutes, but it's a good time to give a little sense of, uh, we have uh, the two of you are here to represent corporates on one side and on the other side, bridge organizations that have, uh, that have established a presence here. So you want to, maybe, maybe uh, Claire, if you want to come here, it's probably easier. Or as, as you wish, you can do it from there. Just give a, 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 a sense of uh, your presence here in Silicon Valley. Okay, thanks. I would like to thank you, um, Commissioner Gabriel, uh, for the message today. I think it's very inspiring and uh, is a call for action for all of us. So thank you very much. And uh, so I'm Clara, I'm the CEO of Ininext. Ininext is the corporate venture capital company of Eni. We are here, uh, we are in the US based in Boston and um, there for leveraging the ecosystem of the East Coast, but also because we have a long standing uh, relationship with MIT. So, again, the importance of universities uh, in all of that. And uh, we have a branch in UK, but uh, um, since uh, December 2021, we have also an outpost here in, in the Silicon Valley that uh, is helping us uh, to have networking, uh, to sourcing startup. So I think it's really important to be present. So for us, uh, it's important to be here as any, but we are also in Europe. I think connection uh, are really important and the key to create, uh, let's say, a global ecosystem. So. And you're here both with the corporate venture capital and with the entity that is scouting startups to integrate. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Federico, EIT and EIT Digital has been here for quite some time. Um, so maybe a couple of words about the history of EIT here. Indeed. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Commissioner, for the inspiring speech before. And Marco, thanks for the interesting <laughs> work you've done. I think it's important to have a good mapping of the ecosystem. So yeah, EIT Digital, as part of the EIT, established uh, itself here in 2014 as a only EIT Digital presence. And then in 2019, we scaled this presence up uh, by adding let's say, opening up to the entire EIT community. So now we run activities together with the IT Climate Kick, with the IT Urban Mobility, and any other kick who wants to join is, of course, uh, uh, most welcome. So what do we do here? Uh, we really built this hub as a two-way bridge between Europe and US. So because we observed back in 2014, and the world has changed, but uh, we, we this element is still there, unfortunately, that the direction was always uh, one direction, from Europe to the US. We really want to have this bi-direction, um, bi-directional element. So we help uh, students from the US to come to Europe. For example, we are now in discussion to bring some Euro uh, American students to a summer school that we are organizing uh, in, um, on cybersecurity in Europe. We help last year FedEx to run an innovation program in Europe uh, to, together with us and EIT Climate Kick, for example. And we run here, for example, uh, corporate challenges in the, uh, in the way of hackathons, where we help uh, both European and American corporates in solving their challenges with hands-on support by our students or any other uh, talent that is available here or in, uh, in Europe. So we are, I think, going forward, our ambition would be to, to grow this hub more, have more kicks involved from the EIT family, and to really build more the direction from US to Europe, because I think now the maturity of the two innovation ecosystem is, uh, is good and uh, it is aligned. So we really want to have this two-way bridge. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, last, I think it's time to call here again Commissioner Gabriel. We're going to hand you this report. So thank you very much. You have the the forward of, of this report, and maybe it might be time to comment uh, a high level what you think well, about this, uh, this data overall. Maybe it's okay like that, no? Sure, or, okay. or on the podium. Well, thank you very much, uh, dear Marco, for this report. I think that it's one of the main deliverables of this European Innovation Agora. I'm commissioner for research too, so I like very much data. And it's always good to have not only call for action, but to have it 
based on evidence and data. And that's why I think that that's a key milestone. Thank you very much for this. The second, I would like really to, to underline that here we can see some very positive tendencies that they are just confirming what we try to do with the New European Innovation Agenda, with these New European Innovation Days. So I, I can hear, uh, I would like just uh, to, to mention uh, how stronger is our European presence and that shows the maturity of the ecosystem and that shows that we need to continue to strengthen our collaboration. So very good, good message. On the other side, I've seen the drop, <laughs> drop out of the, the dual companies. I think that that's something good and we need maybe to look a little bit more into your interactive part of the map in order to show this with concrete examples and to see what are the, positives, the positive sides. For me, it's something that we should continue to follow very closely because what, what is the message for me is that companies that are created, developed in Europe, they can become global players. And that's something that we need really to continue to speak a little bit more loudly. It's not only when you create a startup or to stay on the European continent. So thank you very much. Thank you for these very encouraging messages. And of course, I will invite every one of you to continue to read the report and to look a little bit more into details. And congratulations for the work that is done. And here, I would like to address a message to the EIT and our delegation, because our presence here, if we see now this positive tendency, is because since 2019, we have the EIT Silicon Valley Hub, and thank you very much, EIT Digital and the other kicks. Thank you very much, Samira. And I would like to say thank you to our delegation, dear Gerard. I think that we are Team Europe, and we count on you to continue to show us that this twofold bridge is bringing benefits for both sides and it's helping our companies to grow and it's making us proud of our champions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see the plan here. You lure over the students with your delicious food, all of your interesting places to visit. Yeah, that works for me. I actually have a child right now who is headed off for an exchange program in Paris. So clearly, I am falling for this game. All right, so we have another panel uh, coming up right now. This discussion is going to be, how do European Union universities make European Union innovation ecosystems attractive for innovators? And I would like to invite up our moderator, Antonetta Angeleva Kravasteva. Hopefully I pronounced that right. <laughs> uh, Director, Innovation, Digital Education and International Cooperation, Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport, Culture, European Commission. Uh, that is an impressive title. I like that. It's practically overlord. Come on up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carrie, for this uh, presentation and really a brilliant pronunciation of my full name. I know it's a very, very uh, complicated one. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, let me once again welcome you all who are here uh, in the room today with us and those who are also following the event online. Uh, indeed, after all these inspiring uh, speeches and very interesting presentation of the report, uh, it is time uh, to continue now again the conversation, uh, shifting the focus again on the universities as it was already announced. Uh, I'm really thrilled uh, for having the opportunity to uh, moderate uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel already underlined the importance of uh, the universities. Uh, they are at the heart of the innovation ecosystem. They are one of the key assets of uh, the European innovation agenda and the ecosystem. So it's time really to look at what we need and what the European universities do actually to attract talent from outside Europe, but also to nurture the talent that is in Europe. Uh, they play also a key role in facilitating the collaboration, the interaction between the various actors, which is uh, extremely important as uh, we've already witnessed throughout all uh, discussions. We have a lot of uh, stakeholders, a lot of uh, actors, and it's uh, 
mostly the case that university bring them together in order to make innovation happen. So without further ado, we're going to have a very interesting discussion with our distinguished panelists who are representing the academic community. And we have representatives of European universities. Let me first invite to the stage Professor Ilke Niemela, who is uh, president of the Aalto University in Finland. Professor Niemela. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Professor Svein uh, Stollen, who is rector of the University of Oslo in Norway, and he is also the chair of the Guild Group, which brings together European research intensive universities. Welcome, Professor Stalin. We have also with us uh, Professor Vasile Topa, who is a rector of the Technical University of Cluj-Napoca in Romania. Welcome. Welcome, Professor Topper. Last but not least, we have the voice of the, Euro, of the American universities. And I'm very uh, happy to invite to the stage uh, Professor Narges Bianasidi. Um, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> Who is the founder, the founder and executive director of uh, Emergence Program at Stanford University. A very warm welcome to all of you very distinguished uh, uh, panel. So uh, we have only 30 minutes, um, so I would like to immediately go to my first question. Uh, this first question will be to Professor Niemela. Ilka, can you tell us uh, something more about the Auto University, which is uh, actually unique in its experience of bringing together science, uh, technology, art and business, from your perspective, uh, what makes European higher education attractive to global talent and how does it foster innovation and entrepreneurship? Share with us your views and experience. Uh, thank you. Uh, really um, uh, interesting question. Um, I think there are a number of good reasons why um, Europe is very attractive to global uh, talent. Um, and let me give you, uh, let's say, five top reasons that I find very interesting and, and relevant. First of all, as, as the Commissioner very well uh, put, Europe is strong in research, and I think in particular in areas that are growing in importance for the future. Uh, Europe is also very committed to take a pioneering role in battling climate change and, and sustainably uh, uh, driving sustainable development. We have very high quality, higher education available in Europe. Uh, and the research in Europe is actually very well connected. So it's easy to f find high quality partners and collaboration. And then perhaps last but not least, European values and ways of working provide an environment where we can make an impact um, with your talent, but in a balanced way. And maybe I'll, I'll uh, just uh, elaborate some of the points uh, from the point of view of my home university, Aalto. First of all, uh, Europe is strong in research, and this, uh, this is particularly true in areas which are relevant for sustainable development. And uh, this is, this is uh, important because sustainability challenges are not just threats, but actually uh, they provide huge business opportunities, if we can really bring science-based new innovations efficiently to the market. At Aalto, as, as, um, as mentioned, we bring together three areas very relevant for innovations, science and technology, business, and art and design. And uh, we are very strong uh, in, um, uh, in particular in 5G, 6G, uh, AI, quantum, um, bio-based materials and uh, circular economy. And our approach has been uh, that actually we want to uh, uh, combine uh, research-based expertise in deep technology with uh, high-quality uh, business and art and design competencies and encourage our students a lot as well as a faculty to take their research findings and ideas to practice. 
we have a very strong entrepreneurial ecosystem. Something like 100 uh, new startups are born in, in it uh, every year. And um, Aalto is actually one of the uh, hottest places for uh, deep tech spin-outs in, in EU, uh, including uh, companies like uh, IQM, the, the fastest uh, growing uh, European quantum computing company, actually the CEO of uh, uh, the company, uh, Jan Götz, is uh, actually with, the, with us in the, in the delegation, or ISI, that actually is the leading uh, European manufacturer of uh, microsatellites. Uh, actually, um, uh, sort of uh, building world's smallest uh, SAR satellite, satellites in the, and act, acting globally. For example, just last week, ISI closed a multi-million deal with NASA. Uh, and then uh, what is interesting for the uh, uh, higher education offering is that it's starting to move towards these really interesting areas like AI, uh, 5G, quantum, and also um, uh, uh, green transition. And this is, this is creating new opportunities. The, really, the, one of the issues for us is that the European research is very well connected. We have tight, uh, uh, good, uh, high quality networks among uh, universities, and, and we collaborate very closely. Also, universities, research institutes, and public sector is brought efficiently together uh, with uh, EU Horizon networks and uh, the, across Europe. And Alto is very, very uh, active in those networks, but not just in Europe, but globally. Actually, I think we are one of the most international universities in EU at the moment. Um, we have something like 130 nationalities at Alto. Half of the uh, research and teaching staff is actually from abroad, and two-thirds of our uh, publications are done in international collaboration. So that's, uh, that's quite a lot. Um, and last but not least, uh, for us, European values and ways of working are important. We strive for excellence uh, and, and also impact, but in a balanced way. And I think we are, at, at least in Finland and across the Europe, we're doing quite a good work. Uh, just la a few days ago, Finland was uh, uh, ranked the happiest country in the world, sixth time in the row. So that's a quite an achievement. Thank you. Really impressive. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Niemela. Uh, how does this uh, resonate uh, with you, Professor Topa? Uh, the Technical University of Cluj-Napoca is a very active participant in a wide number of European initiatives which actually aim to support uh, collaboration between universities, their innovation and entrepreneurial uh, capacity. What is uh, your experience from this participation and uh, how do you see uh, the opportunities to attract and nurture talent. Thank you, Antonietta, for the question. Hello to everybody. Uh, in order to answer to your question, I will uh, go back and I will tell you a story, a story related to what it happens in my country. I'm coming from the east part of Europe. And of course, we are, after 30 years of uh, the beginning of the democracy in this part of Europe. It was a very difficult period at the beginning. And uh, many countries from even from Europe don't trust in East part. And I'm sure that it happens also here in America. But we said, OK, we will continue and we will work in the manner that we know. And we apply all the policies and all the strategies and we use all the tools that can be offered by the European Commission. What it happens? Now, around 12 years ago, I had a delegation. In fact, in each day, we had such delegation coming to set up their facilities in Cluj. And uh, uh, this delegation came to me and said, OK, you want to, to open up a, a factory. 
in automation. I said, okay, you are welcome. How should I help you? And uh, they put me several questions. I present the university. I go with them in labs and so on. This was the first uh, delegation. I didn't know anything about this company, but they came more than half year. And after half year, I was asking them, sorry, how many engineers, in fact, you need? I want to mention that our university has around 20,000 students. And they said, you know, we want to start with 15, 20 students, uh, engineers, sorry, engineers. And I was asking them, and for 20 engineers, you are coming six months. Now, I will tell you the company. The company is Emerson. And they set up their facilities in Cluj. Today, having 3,500 employees. This was the beginning, now 12, 10 years ago. After that, the city was growing step by step. Now we have Bosch company, 3,500 employees. Porsche, and many, many other. And now, of course, the question is you are thinking, what, why, why it happens this? Because we have these students before, we have these talents there. And the answer is very simple. First of all, we are a very strong community. We have the support of the local authorities. And we have very enthusiastic people. Today, we have around 20,000 small, medium, and large IT companies. And they are coming and coming and coming. This is the reason that Emilia said yesterday that everybody in Europe, and especially in our, our part of Europe, they said is the future Silicon Valley. Because the people are coming not only from our region, not from our country, but all over the Europe. So I'm thinking that it's time for the talents from here, from USA, to take into account this part of Europe. And they will be very surprised what they will find there in a good sense. Now uh, for the future. Now we took uh, the, one of the opportunities offered by the university uh, strategies. I'm speaking about the European alliances. Probably you know, or if you don't know, already at the level of Europe are 44 such European alliances. And we are part of one of these. It's called European University of Technology. And we are partner with other seven technological universities from Europe, from Dublin, from, from uh, Cartagena, from Darmstadt, from Sofia, from Riga. I hope that I told all of them. <laughs> ah, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Cyprus and France. Yeah. What are our expectations, in fact? In fact, the one, today we are, we are eight campuses, but we plan to be a single one. We work very hard in the last three years to set up this new institution, this new university, and I'm very confident in the next year it will be, it will be a very successful one. We decided at the level of this uh, Alliance to start more institutes, research in this institute. And one of these which will be in Cluj, it will be in IE, artificial intelligence. We have the support of the European Bank of Investment. So thank you very much if it's somebody from the bank. Yesterday it was. Our government. And also uh, from uh, our industrial partners. This institute will be offered for the beginning, of course, to all our partners from the Alliance, but is open to all the other partners from Europe. And with this occasion, I invite from USA to join us. And finally, I want to finish with uh, and to quote Henry Ford. He said something like that, being together, it's a beginning. Staying together, it's a progress. And working together, of course, it's a success. 
So we are together. I invite you to come to Europe, and I can assure that you'll be a success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Topa. Indeed, uh, very insightful uh, reflections on all these issues. Just for our audience to say that the European Union um, initiative is uh, one of uh, the other flagship initiatives of Commissioner Gabriel, uh, which uh, promotes uh, closer cooperation uh, amongst the European uh, universities. And I very much uh, hope that uh, the American investors, students, researchers will take your very warm welcome uh, to Cluj-Napoca. But let me now uh, move uh, to Professor Stolen. Uh, you currently have, as I already announced, two hats. So based on your rich experience, it will be indeed very um, interesting to hear uh, how you see our cooperation with the universities here in the uh, United States and what you think is still needed to enhance the existing contacts and collaboration, including the um, exchanges of students and uh, academic staff. Over to you. Thank you so much and uh, pleasure to be here. I mean, it's always a pleasure to come to California. Excellent universities, excellent innovation systems. I think it's a lot to learn. I represent the Guild of Research Intensive Universities, 21, among the best universities in Europe. They're research intensive, they are internationally oriented, and they're also eager to see that knowledge is taken into use, and that's important, of course. University of Oslo, yes, but I also led the f one of the first uh, European university initiative. I was the president of Circle U when it was initiated, and that was about student mobility, of course. And I think that I can speak on behalf of all these universities when I say that transatlantic cooperation is extremely important. It's a priority. It's maybe more important than ever because of the geopolitical situation. And I think that we really need to focus on how to strengthen the cooperation. I'm a chemist, so I often talk about single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds. We need to make more triple bonds and strengthen the cooperation, really. Uh, what can we do? I think we have quite a lot of good instruments. And the first thing we have to do is to utilize these instruments well. Erasmus Plus is an extremely important instrument for Europe. It is possible also to use that for cooperation with USA. So look into that, see how we can get more American students to Europe through Erasmus+, Plus. I think is important. We have to use what we already have, and then we have to look into where are the problems. So there are some, how to say, barriers that we need to tear down as well. And I think what might be a solution is always to look into, how to say, past experience, and I think that also looking into the European universities, which are about mobility, what we see is that close institutional collaboration is extremely important. So to build institution, not only individual uh, connections, is extremely important. Um, I believe that looking into the future, we, we, we have quite a number of students that are able to move to other countries in Europe and USA, but I think that they need maybe a little bit more support than previously. So we are advocating an all-inclusive type of travel to uh, other countries which are integrated into the study program to make it easier and also more predictable for the students uh, what they can achieve abroad. When it comes to researchers, I think we need to utilize different strengths in different continents. Um, University of Oslo was happy to be one of the first European universities that uh, imported the SPARC program from Stanford on life science. And that's been really uh, very interesting and we learned a lot. But then we transformed that also into social innovation. And we asked Stanford, are we, are we allowed to use the brand SPARC also for the social innovation? And they said yes, because they also would like to see how we are working with social innovation, which I think is extremely important. Uh, I think also in Europe we have a different uh, asset that needs to be exploited better, and that is long-term series of health data, which are not that common in USA. In Norway, we have cancer information from 1953. Social security number is connected to the health and, and the patients. And for that reason, to be able to tap into that potential is extremely important. And then I will be brief and, and fin finish with a small challenge, because in order to do that, we also have the GDPR challenge, where we have to align a little bit between USA and Europe, I think, in order to get forward. But uh, it's a pleasure to work with American universities, and we should do that even more in the future. 
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stolen, indeed, for uh, very clearly outlining uh, the existing instruments and the potential uh, for the growing the cooperation that we have. Uh, indeed, very important to uh, base on the experience and uh, instruments that are uh, available. And I'm uh, sure that uh, Professor Banyas Banyasari. Yeah, I got it, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it will be indeed uh, useful, great to hear from you, how you see from your perspective of uh, um, our discussions, reflections on all these issues. Uh, you have also the personal experience of uh, founding a company. So uh, it will be indeed uh, great to share your uh, views, your journey of becoming an innovator, entrepreneur, and from the Stanford University perspective, uh, to tell us more of uh, what is important uh, for attracting global talent. We often speak about the fierce competition about uh, talents. Uh, we need the skills to address and uh, tackle all these uh, important uh, pressing societal challenges. But over to you, it will be very interesting to listen to you now. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for including me on such an amazing panel. Uh, a lot to learn from other panelists here. So my name is Narga Spania Sedi. I share with you my personal story because I am one of the byproducts of Silicon Valley <laughs> and now working on improving the innovation ecosystem here to align it more with social impact. Uh, so I originally grew up in Iran, and then I migrated to the U.S. Uh, to pursue my graduate studies at Stanford University about 18 years ago. I did my Ph.D. in computational biology and electrical engineering at Stanford, and then went forward and started a company in the bioinformatics and genomics space. Starting a company is more probably rather than the norm than exception at Stanford because of a very supportive ecosystem both on campus and around it and I really took advantage of the education that I received there a lot of experiential coursework that you can go and basically present your ideas get feedback from investors and industry mentors and get the encouragement to go forward and launch a company and uh, I eventually sold my company to the European um, biopharma company Roche where I had the honor to serve as an executive vice president of AI and informatics from 2014 to 2018. And after that, I have been working with many startups, both actually in the US as well as uh, Europe. I spent 2019 in Europe and UK and worked with Entrepreneur First, the big incubator there, as well as Oxford University and helped uh, several companies actually launch the US, including Base Genomics, which had a historic um, exit of $420 million to exact sciences two, two years ago. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I came back to Stanford University to, to start a new educational program called Emergence. At Emergence, we develop research and educational programs to um, align entrepreneurship innovation with societal impact, especially focused on the health of planet and the society by uh, looking at the root causes of health challenges, food security, mental health, misinformation, and the impact of climate change, of course, on global health. And the reason I came back to Stanford to do that is because through my own innovation and entrepreneurial journey, and also being in the corporate, I realized that our innovation ecosystem is not completely um, opt in a very optimal way. It's not aligned with actually solving the most biggest problems that we are solving. And I know you are all here, you know, being inspired by Silicon Valley entrepreneurship system, but I believe the same playbook that got us here, that helped us launch a lot of social media or, you know, tech companies, cannot take us to the next level. In order to solve the big systemic challenges we are facing, whether in the health of planet, society, inequalities, we are facing, we need a new innovation ecosystem that incorporates equity and sustainability in the every step of the journey. And for that, we do need also a new, not only new frameworks and methodologies of innovation, but we also need to have access to patient capital. And also we need to have an ecosystem of cross-sector collaboration. 
So startups usually only talk to investors and maybe at the end of their journey, they also talk to corporates in order to sell sometimes their product or being bought out as an exit strategy. But in order to solve these challenges, we also need uh, deep conversations between the pro public sector, social sector, with the innovation ecosystem. Uh, that is how we can create new business models and new sources of funding, as well as really the insight that comes from the public sector and social sector into what problems we're solving and how we can solve it. So that is uh, part of the work that we are doing um, at Stanford. I, th there's much more to share, but happy to talk to you after the panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Banyasadi. So I just want to check with a uh, very interesting story, indeed, uh, your journey, but also very important what you said that uh, where we are cannot take us to the next level and we definitely need further developments in order to ensure better equity, sustainability of the innovation ecosystem. And this brings me actually to my um, kind of the next question to all panelists, uh, for all of you who'd like to uh, touch upon this uh, uh, issue. Uh, in, in the context of our transatlantic uh, uh, cooperation, uh, given that we have shared values, uh, shared culture, do you see anything uh, additional that could be strengthened uh, in order to foster innovation and entrepreneurship more broadly, not only bridging our innovation uh, ecosystems? Anything that uh, you might have not touched upon in your uh, replies, uh, if you'd like to further elaborate on that? from that uh, uh, perspective. And anyone would like to start? Please. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, I think one, one thing that uh, hasn't been discussed yet, but I think it was, was a you know, big thing for, uh, for Aalto is that we, and, and where we should be learning a lot from, from the US and the Silicon Valley ecosystem is the, the importance of the kind of an entrepreneurial mindset. And that has certainly made a big difference for, for us. Uh, we started wor working with, uh, collaborating with Stanford uh, at more than a decade ago, and, and the idea was actually to uh, create an entrepreneurial uh, program for, for students uh, based on um, a sta corresponding program in, in Stanford. Uh, it's now called Alto Ventures Program. It's actually very popular for, for, uh, for, uh, for our students, and it gives kind of hands-on uh, competencies in, in uh, entrepreneurship. And this is something... Um, that we have been doing uh, a lot. And, and then the other thing that, you know, it's actually about people. So when we start sending uh, our students for internships uh, in Silicon Valley uh, startups, and when these guys or uh, girls came back, they were real game changers in, in the kind of uh, setting the uh, scene and, and the kind of ambition level. Uh, but, but it's sort of also important that uh, th this part that... Uh, how to create this collaboration and uh, bring uh, different parties together, uh, whether it's, it's actually like uh, when, when you start solving these systemic problems uh, re related to sustainability, that you need collaboration between companies different, of different sizes, public uh, sector, you need the data. And this is where I think uh, we in Europe uh, have uh, great possibilities to uh, um, show uh, a little bit how, how, how that ha is being done. Uh, at Alto, um, we have been promoting quite a lot of uh, student-led initiatives, so, and that ha those have created quite a momentum. M some of you might know Schloss. It's the, the biggest uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, conference in Europe. That's, that's being created by Alto students. Junction is actually one of Europe's largest uh, uh, hackathon also created by, by Alto students, so really entrepreneurial set, but it's uh, entrepreneurial mindset. But then what we are doing a, a lot is actually bringing different uh, uh, stakeholders together. Uh, we have uh, our partners on, on our campus working to, uh, directly uh, together with us, uh, working on uh, public data, and those kinds of things are uh, really important things. Uh, uh, having 150 startups working in the middle of the campus is, is a big asset and, and uh, a big uh, uh, driver for uh, development. I think we are doing uh, something right. Uh, our own uh, startup uh, accelerator, Alto Startup Center, was actually ranked quite recently 
in top three in uni university-based uh, accelerators in the world. So I think that combining forces and working much closer together is a way forward in the, to address the big challenges of the world. Thank Thanks. you very much, uh, uh, Professor Niemel. Very briefly, uh, Professor Banyasadi, you'd like to uh, also add uh, a few words, and I would like to check with the audience whether there is any question. I know that we are running out of time, but over to you, if you'd like to. I, I just echo similar points. I think we can use the opportunities of climate change, global health, as goals to really collaborate. And I also see that Europe and uh, Silicon Valley bring complementary values together. Here we might have more entrepreneurial and agile spirit, but then as you shared, Europe has more balanced and, and global perspective. And uh, we need both of these. We need the best of the world to come together to solve our global challenges and there are a lot of opportunities. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. Let me check with the audience. Uh, uh, is there any question uh, uh, that uh, you'd like to pose to our panelists? Doesn't seem to be the case, but I have one final and I hope you bear with us. Uh, perhaps, uh, Professor Stolen, you can tell us, uh, in your opinion, what could be the one or the most um, uh, important uh, quality that uh, a future innovator may have to acquire? In your opinion, what is important for young people if they want to become innovators? I will try a slightly challenging answer, I think, because I think that when you look into innovation systems and, and what we discuss here, one size never fits all. So I think in all universities, in all ecosystems, you need to find the strength of that. At University of Oslo, it's a comprehensive university. We look into how can we take basic science into use. We are extremely good at social sciences. How can we do social innovation? So I think that we really need to work with the students, for sure. But I, I, I would like to make this point about not putting everything into one system. We need to adjust to what we are as institutions and districts. This is a very insightful comment. And what is the quality you would recommend to an innovator? Do you have any advice, Mr. Topper, Professor Topper? Anything you would suggest to a young uh, person who would like to become an innovator? Yes, to believe that they will succeed. Excellent. <laughs> this is an excellent concluding remark. Please uh, join me in uh, thanking our uh, I have to I have panelists, a wonderful, fantastic panel. Thank you very much. I have a question. I'm sorry, oh, I have sorry. a question. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. excuse me. Yeah, right. please. Um, so one of the things we're facing here and around the world is just the speed of innovation. And so you hear that there's generation gaps every three years now. So I'm interested in what it is we're doing to keep our leaders, who are often generationally more advanced, um, quick to the chase and educated and working in new and different ways. Thank you for your question. Who would like to answer this uh, question? Oh, very briefly, all of you. We need more diverse leaders. Good, very good answer. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> One of the successes at the University of Oslo is a student accelerated, made by the students for the students. So we have to involve the young people. And as an older leader, I have to keep a little bit distance and give them space, give them money, and help them. Yeah, I, 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 I can agree with that. I think one of the biggest things at all, though, that we have done uh, for getting the kind of young people excited about uh, you know, new innovations and entrepreneurship is to get out of the way. Thank you very much. Mr. Topper, any final word from your side answering this question? No, big thanks to all of you for this uh, fantastic conversation. Thank you. Now, I guess you guys are ready for the most important way to bridge European and Silicon Valley energy, the coffee break. So get to your networking, get to your coffee, jazz up. Half of you should be in bed right now. <laughs> we'll see you back here in about half an hour. <laughs>
everybody. Have you got your coffee? Is everybody feeling energized and ready to get back up on it? I invite you to take your seats and get ready for an exciting second half. I don't know why I'm yelling. I have a microphone on. <laughs> Anybody stick a little bit of the uh, fun stuff in your coffee? That'll get you going. Oi! <laughs> nice try. I knew. If I'm on stage too long. I don't know if anybody trades cards anymore, but taking all of your QR codes into each other's phones. Our next panel discussion is about to start. Aligning U.S. and European Union innovation ecosystems. Now, how does the, the new European innovation agenda create an effective innovation ecosystem in Europe? We're going to have that question answered. <laughs> I'm going to give it a minute because yeah. you deserve the floor, sir. Thank you deserve you. the floor. <laughs> Jan is the man. Jan. Jan is the man. Everybody take your seats and quiet down, please. All right. I can, I can hear us calming. Okay. This is where I introduce Jan Bormans, chair of the Coalition of the Willing to Co-Implement Innovation Agenda EU. Everybody give it up for Jan. Thank you for the kind introduction and to silence this somewhat difficult crowd. They're so energetic, right? So on a personal note, if you allow me, it's, uh, it's good to be back here in Silicon Valley. In a previous professional life, I was active in uh, advanced semiconductor research and I was here very often and it was really very often. I uh, often knew the traffic uh, situation better here in the Silicon Valley than in my hometown. And I still feel and love the vibe, so it's good to be back. We have an exciting uh, panel for you guys today. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce them and to call them to the floor. And in order, first, Professor Mark Ferguson, Chairman of the European Innovation Council. Mark. And then we have Juan Garcia Gallardo, which is Vice President of Castilla y Leon region in Spain. Welcome, Juan. Next up, we have Tanya Heristova, Major of Khabrovo in Bulgaria. Then it's my pleasure to welcome Nora Kaldi of the Governing Board of the, and member of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And finally, from the beautiful island of Cyprus, it's my pleasure to welcome Konstantinos Iacordis, which is mayor of Nicosia. So we have a stellar uh, panel here with us. Um, I will let them speak because that's why we're here. But let me introduce them a little bit what the purpose of this panel is. Okay? You have it, heard it before in the previous panels. Uh, ecosystems are front and center in the European innovation agenda. So let me add some information from our point of view uh, towards you. In 2021, uh, the European Commission, uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Gabriel, launched an outreach to different innovation stakeholder groups to better understand what the real needs were. 
These groups included uh, different startup networks, unicorn CEOs, female founders, and women in VC. And this outreach was so intense that, in fact, it was a real co-creation process with intense discussions and working sessions. In these sessions, we tried to explain to each other what we thought was necessary, uh, what necessary actions were. It was, I think, a massive effort, and it was certainly not a us against them uh, spirit, but it was a process where we built on each other's ideas to pursue a common goal to become leading in deep tech and startups. When the NEA was uh, published in uh, July 2022, we decided in less than 24 hours to pivot towards a co-implementation approach. So we went from co-creation to co-implementation. Um, and so we call that approach the uh, coalition of the willing. We are a broad coalition of local authorities, innovative corporates, startup ecosystems, collaborating with our many universities and university alliances. So um, again, I'm very happy to have important innovation stakeholders in our panel. Today we will discuss how the new European Innovation Agenda strengthens our innovation ecosystems, as well as how it fosters collaboration within these uh, ecosystems and between them. And as such, uh, this is a natural way to ease the collaboration also with you here in the US to work commonly towards our goals. So, this being said, I've spoken too much already maybe. So, Mark, could you explain me uh, what is the innovation ecosystem you consider and what your role is and what's the link to the uh, innovation agenda? Sure, thank you very much indeed. So I will speak a little bit about the European Innovation Council. And for the European Innovation Council, I want you to remember four A's, okay? Four A's. It's a great four A's, all right? So A number one is to advance. We want to advance use-inspired research that is going to lead to technological developments that are important for the economy or for society, and they're important for technological sovereignty with friends. And that's the Pathfinder program. So that's the first A. The second A is accelerate. We want to accelerate the movement of technology from university laboratories, from companies, from loan founders into commercial reality. And that's done in two programs. It's done in transition, which is what it says on the tin, which is transitioning from an academic lab into a commercial uh, laboratory uh, and into a commercial product. Or it's done through Accelerator, which is essentially an investment in a company, two and a half million grant, up to 30 million in equity. So that's the second A, which is Accelerate. The third A is Address. We want to address societal problems. We want to address economic problems. We want to address inclusivity. We are particularly keen to foster innovation with women-led companies. We are particularly keen to uh, uh, encourage innovation from the underserved parts of the European uh, Commission. So that's the third A. And then the fourth A is activate. We want to activate partners, we want to work with investors, we want to work with companies, we want to work with collaborators, we co-invest, we will not be investing on our own. So crowding in is a really, really, really important principle of the European Innovation Council. So those are the four A's, those are the things to remember. The three programs that we run across Europe, Pathfinder to encourage cutting edge use inspired research, Transition to transition it to commercial again, and then uh, acceleration, which is encouraging investment in small and medium enterprises. So, I will close with the words of a famous, now dead, Irish poet, Seamus Heaney. And what Seamus Heaney said was, anyone with gumption and a sharp mind can distinguish between two things, what's said and what's done. And let me tell you that the European Innovation Council is a new instrument, but what's done is we have invested now in over 100 companies. We have invested in companies that didn't exist. 16 of them are now unicorns. We have over 100 centaurs. We have over 1,000 innovations. We have over 500 company investments. There's a lot more we can do. There's a lot more we can do in partnership with others. but. It's not just talk, it's actually action. We are an execution agency and we are executing innovation across Europe. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you, Mark. And uh, being from a startup background, of course, we appreciate action-based uh, uh, processes and, and organizations. Um, your ecosystem is clearly the whole of Europe, eh? and uh, it's very clear what you, what you do. Now we shift to a region, and uh, I'm very excited to hear what Juan will say about, uh, about your region. So, Juan, please take the floor. Thank you, Jan, and uh, hi, America. Hi, Team Europe. We are a team coming here to present ourselves, and I'm very proud of being part of this Coalition of the Willing. It's an honor to share the floor with such an amazing panel. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we, the Spanish people, came here in the uh, many centuries ago, and we founded many of these cities. We founded San Diego, we founded uh, Los Angeles, we founded San Francisco. <laughs> so th there's, there's a clear thing about it. <laughs> If you like California, if you like San Francisco, you will for sure love Spain, and in particular my region, Castilla y León. So you will always feel welcome, you will always uh, feel uh, like one of us. We feel American people as brothers from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So please come and visit us and you will get in love for sure. Um, Castilla y León is the largest region in Spain is uh, the largest rural area in Spain and the third in Europe. Uh, it's 94,000 kilo, uh, square kilometers, and uh, we are uh, 2,300,000 inhabitants. So there's few people for a very uh, extensive piece of land. We have 33 protected uh, rural uh, and natural areas with a great biodiversity that we feel very proud of, and we are the, the region with the most World Heritage Sites in the whole Europe. So you must come and visit us. Uh, we are the leaders in rural tourism in Spain because all of this matters, but also because we have one of the best wines, uh, cheese <laughs> and food products, as you all know, because uh, French and Italian wine are great. I love them, but Spanish <laughs> wine is the best and you know it. But uh, here we are talking about innovation and uh, a very important thing in innovation as we heard in the last round table is the universities. We have nine universities, four of them public, five of them private. One of them is one of the oldest in Europe. It's the University of Salamanca. You, uh, the people from the uh, Coimbra uh, Alliance know, know it well. And they cooperate uh, with companies and they have a model that promotes innovation that for us is a key. Uh, these universities give the, the economy a very talented people because I'm going to give you many reasons to invest and to come to Spain, but uh, the best uh, reason is our people. Uh, in Castilla y Leon, we have loyal people, hardworking, and also people that uh, me, um, will make you feel very welcome. Uh, we also have 32 research centers that uh, boost innovation, and we are very proud of them. We have also many uh, technological centers. If I don't remember bad, they are uh, 11, and that makes us uh, have a very uh, interesting, innovative ecosystem. We have uh, 2,500 uh, innovative companies, also many uh, strong startups, as you all uh, many of you already know because we, are, we were talking uh, before. And that uh, habilitated us, that uh, mm, permitted us to be the first innovation valley in Europe. We met the commissioner in a startup event in Salamanca. Uh, we were talking in a short meeting and uh, when she talked uh, to us and, and explained us what the innovation valleys were, this um, instrument to cooperate between regions uh, to implement uh, innovative uh, interregional projects, then we went for it, and that's why we are uh, today here. Castilla y León uh, has a strong uh, GDP. In dollars, it's uh, 61 billion dollars, and in euros, uh, 58,000 million uh, euros. But not everything is about economy. In Castilla y León, we have a great quality of life. The cost of living is very attractive. For the price, uh, you people from California buy a small apartment, you will buy a big house in Castilla y León. And I think this is a very important reason to have a great house in an amazing place 
uh, next to a natural space like is uh, Castilla y León. We have a high quality uh, public uh, services. Uh, we are leaders in education, as the PISA report says every, every year. And we have also a very high quality healthcare system that, as, as you know, is very important for everybody. Mm. Also, there's a thing that is important uh, for us and is the safety of, of the people. Spain, as a nation, is one of the uh, safest nations uh, from the European Union, but inside Spain, uh, we are the fourth with the best, uh, with the lowest crime rate. Uh, so that's very important for us. Also, we have the third lowest unemployment rate from Spain. So that uh, means that we are um, a strong economy with a very big industry that make us also feel very proud. We have also a very strong agricultural sector. We also uh, give a firm support to our farming sector. And also we have a very competitive and strong uh, automotive sector with companies you may know as Renault, Nissan, also Iveco for trucks, other as Group Antolin for components, and that also is a very important thing for you to know. We have a cultural heritage in common, as I said at the beginning, and this is important because Castilla y León is the region where the Spanish language uh, was originated, a language that is a lot spoken here in California, but also that is spoken by hundreds of millions of people uh, around the world, and that makes us be the perfect bridge between Europe, America, and also we have a geographical strategic position to connect with Africa. Actually, Castilla y León is in the middle north of Spain between Madrid and the north coast, and also between uh, Portugal and France. So we are in the middle of the axis between Lisbon and Paris. So for all logistic platforms and to install uh, new industries, uh, we are a very uh, important thing to take into account. And I think I'm running out of time, so I will finish just by saying that Castilla y León has a business-friendly government that uh, welcomes foreign investment and that Castilla y León is a place to be happy, to have a good quality of life and the best place to live, to invest and to raise a family. So thank you and we'll keep talking in the next coffee break. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned, which is very important, is this concept of innovation valley. So our ambition in the European innovation agenda is to have 100 of such innovation valleys. And so this was the first one. So it's a very concrete first step. So then in the level of granularity, so we had Europe, a region. So now we go to the level of a city with Tanya. And so I look forward to your views. Please take the floor. Thank you very much, Jan. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this innovative mission that is coming from Europe to the United States to present our European potential. And I'm especially grateful for the opportunity to pre represent uh, one of the Bulgarian municipality. My municipality is called Gabrovo. It is located in the central part of our country and is not so big as Castilla de Leon, but I think we are also quite unique and interesting. And I will try to attract your attention with mentioning just a few things, because otherwise I will need at least a week to tell you different in stories and interesting facts about my city. But first of all, we are one of the most entrepreneurial and industrial uh, city of the Bulgarian region, of Bulgaria in general. And we have very innovative and ambitious technical university with industry together and with uh, the local authority, we work to establish our innovation ecosystem. This is something very important because we want to be as competitive as at least Castilla de Leon and many other regions across Europe. But apart from being very industrial uh, with rising ICT companies in recent years, we are very happy to be the city which is unique in terms of being the capital of humor and satire. So not being the happiest nation, we are the nation that has the only museum on humor and satire. And we organize unique carnival in May. You are all invited this year on the 20th of May. And this event is mainly associated with 
political satire and nobody will be spared, not even me myself. Well, coming back to what we are doing uh, together with our citizens is the fact that apart from being uh, not very big and from coming from a country which is lagging in many aspects behind, we are trying to be ambitious and very proud to be uh, one of the UNESCO cities which was designated in 2017 as the creative city for arts and creative arts and crafts and also in the 2021 we were the city which was at that time the only in southeast europe to be uh, announced as the green leaf city something which motivated us to be uh, also one of the hundred cities in europe that strives to become climate neutral by 2030 and i'm very happy to be a mayor of this um, uh, progressive and innovative city, but I'm also very honored to be member of the European Committee of the Regions, which is an institution working very closely with all the rest of the institutions to protect and to uh, provide the rights of the citizens through the regions and cities to be uh, in place and uh, to ensure that the laws that are created on European level are in accordance with the needs of our citizens and I will not surprise you to tell you that more than 70% of the laws that are created affects directly the citizens across Europe so we are very important in this regards and here I would like to start with telling something about the innovation ecosystem and what in my opinion is very important I will focus on three points and first I would like rather boldly start by saying that we all need to be innovative. We need more innovative companies and more innovative individuals all around us. And here I will cite one of my fellow colleagues from the Committee of the Regions coming from Finland, Marco Marko, who likes to say that we really need a to totally change of, uh, of mentality at all levels of governance because without this we cannot rely on sustainability and especially in the field of innovation ecosystem. And this leads me to my second point because we really need to have more lively innovation ecosystems on both sides of the Atlantic. And here I would like to point out that in Europe we have the opportunity opportunity to enjoy the comprehensive support of the European Commission and also to have the support from different national and European funds. In this way, we have financial support in terms of um, innovation infrastructure and also the individual mobility which provides for the opportunity to have a lively and sustainable uh, ecosystem uh, across Europe. And here comes my third point because probably like in the United States, in Europe we have some more and some less performing and developing regions and cities. And here I would like to cite but now our dear Commissioner Maria Gabriel who rightly points out that no place should be left behind. And we should strive to retain our talents in our regions, but also put efforts to provide for the uh, innovation ecosystems to be developed across Europe. And my experience from Gaborovo tells me that in order to be successful, we have to work together and to apply the so-called quadruple helix approach, something that Mr. Mark also teaches us very strongly and to work together. But I will add something more that we need to invest in our international partnerships. And here I would like to mention the flagship initiative that was started in May last year by the Commissioner Gabriel and by the Commissioner Ferreira with the Partnerships for Regional Innovations, of which my region is proudly to be part of, and which I believe will be a very key stepstone in reaching one of the objectives of the 
new European innovation agenda and very instrumental for the creation of the regional innovation valleys, which will provide with the help of these partnerships to have the importance of the smart specialization strategies and all other European policies as very crucial for the promotion of the innovation driven territories. And I strongly believe that these 100 innovation valleys will engage differently advancing regions thus taking care of the whole innovation ecosystem in Europe. Just 20 seconds. <laughs> Here, I would like to provide uh, your, to, to, give, to uh, attract your attention by sharing with you some of the ideas that I think could be interesting for the American investors. Dear colleagues, I would like to invite the capitalist um, capital, the venture capitals, and the startups to pay attention to Europe and to come to our regions, especially in the East Central Europe, where we have good universities, we have excellent researchers, and we also enjoy very good educational systems. I would also suggest to consider establishing joint ventures with our mechanical engineering and ICT companies, especially with regards to the new opportunities to create cleaner modes of transport, also various urban ecological solutions to build data centers and many more initiatives. And in the context of the war which is going on in Ukraine, I would like also to draw your attention to the, to the opportunities in the military and civil military sector companies, especially in the European member states which are situated in the eastern part of our continent, which projects could be both financed by the Horizon Europe and the specialized European defence fund. And finally, being in the position to be the chair of the SEDEC Commission, which is actually uh, engaged with uh, innovation, education, sports and um, labour activities, I would like to assure you that uh, we maintain strong ties with our um, United States mayors and regional governors and we have the intention to extend our collaboration. And as a chair of this commission, I can assure you that research and innovation will be strongly part of our agenda. And I believe that this will provide additional opportunities in the future. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I think a thing you highlight very correctly is this philosophy behind the new European innovation agenda of innovation cohesion. Uh, so where we want to make sure that the value created by innovation is not centralized in just a few places, but spread over all the union. So thank you for that. So now we zoom back out uh, and we go again to the uh, European level. And so Nora, please take the floor. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, so my name is Dr. Nora Kaldi. I'm representing EIT, um, which stands for the European Innovation uh, Institute of Innovation and Technology in Europe. And I want to tell you a little bit about EIT, but from an angle of an entrepreneur. So I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, I've built a biotech company that's now global, both in Europe and in the US. And when I first started Neurotas, the biotechnology I, I, I founded, it was actually, there was three things I was looking for. Um, and that is obviously uh, people, um, funding, and an ecosystem. So those three things are essential for any company to, to flourish. And that's what you know, Silicon Valley is known for. And at that time, I, I was saying this yesterday, but at that time I was actually living here and there was a choice between, you know, continuing and setting up the company here or setting it up in Europe. I chose Europe at that time for those reasons. So um, it's interesting because EIT is literally at the heart of those three things. So EIT is creating the ecosystem in Europe that really targets both the people so um, the EIT has pledged to skill 
um, upskill about one million individuals in deep tech over the next two to three years, which is massive. But also it's creating that ecosystem within Europe. Um, it's the largest uh, innovation ecosystem in Europe. It's present in every country and we have different parts to it. So there is EIT energy, there's EIT food, there's EIT pharma, etc. And with each of those um, areas, you have a connection between the universities, so the, the, you know, the, the latest science in, in university connected to that field, and all the companies and, and massive corporates working in that field, as well as the innovators. So it's a really interesting group um, that follows an individual from early uh, education, all the way through if that, if that um, person wants to develop a company uh, and, and take that innovation outside a university and create a company with it. Um, that EIT will help there as well and all the way into creating a company and scaling it and then moving forward to upscaling uh, and internationalization. What's interesting, if you look at some of the statistics from EIT, we funded about seven, um, seven unicorns so far. Uh, in the different areas, uh, one of which was was uh, mentioned by um, um, a commissioner, uh, Gabrielle, as well, earlier. Um, but it's really interesting because, like I said, there are three components to any success, and that is people, an ecosystem, uh, and funding. And again, EIT does fund companies from early on all the way, uh, together with the IC that follows as well, which is really interesting. Um, and I think from a US perspective, if there are innovators here, uh, like I was many years ago, thinking of creating something, do think at Europe, because there are a lot of uh, frameworks, uh, like the EIT, like the EIC, that you can really use uh, to grow. Um, there are many, many very, very good science that was shown earlier, um, very good, uh, high, highly skilled individuals in Europe. Um, and I think those things may not be um, perceivable, let's say, when you're sitting here, but there's huge opportunities uh, in the different areas as well that we're talking about. Um, I want to also um, focus on, on talking about EIT from a, uh, from a kick perspective. So I told you about you know, energy, I told you about um, manufacturing and so forth. We have digital here as well that presented earlier. So if you have any questions from a digital perspective, he's presenting here as well. So I'll stop here and I'll... I'll okay, very you. interesting, very compact. So then we move to uh, 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 Constantinos, so the mayor of uh, Nic Nicosia uh, from uh, the... Uh, island of Cyprus, which has a very interesting uh, innovation ecosystem. So um, I realized of the record while preparing this that Cyprus is the only European country I have not been in. And that's why they put us on different parts yeah, of the yeah, stage, yeah, yeah, yeah. because there is some tension, right? There is tension. <laughs> there yeah. is some tension. Uh, before, before I start, uh, I was texting my, uh, my son. He's studying at Stanford. He's 22 and uh, you know arranging what time we're going to meet tonight for dinner and he says where are you and what are you doing and i said that oh, we're with the commissioner and there are other high level people from the commission and the european union and a lot of managers from funds and mayors and everything he said, yeah, yeah yeah okay what time are we meeting and then i said by the way so and so is presenting from mythbusters and he told me Shh, you should have told me to come <laughs> so just to show you the difference in importance that we put <laughs> in, in various issues, yes, it's generation, yeah. yeah. Uh, I come from uh, Nicosia, Cyprus. Cyprus is mostly known, I would guess, if it's known to the audience, for its tourists. And uh, as a business, uh, tourism has one of the largest percentage of our GDP. We are trying, and for some years, we're trying to grow another sustainable uh, pillar of economic growth, uh, this being based in um, knowledge, in getting research commercialized, and getting innovation through either new companies, startups, or existing companies to the everyday life uh, of the, its citizens, Cyprus. So that's what we did at the municipality of Nicosia, uh, using European funding, government funding, but mostly uh, by embracing the vision uh, of the European Union and vision that you can also see um, 
in the new European innovation agenda, which talks about uh, uh, co cooperation uh, and inclusion. Uh, so once we had that, we went and we made partnerships with uh, five institutions, five universities, but no, four universities and one institution, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, uh, the University College of London, and three state universities in Cyprus. And we, create, we, we, we won a Horizon 2020 competitive program, uh, lots of money, 30 million euros, uh, 15 from the government, 15 from the European Union, and we created a research center and in the middle of the old city of Nicosia, also in an effort to rejuvenate an area that needed rejuvenation. Uh, the research center on interactive media and emerging technologies is doing fine. Its main, uh, main purpose, other than research, is what uh, you described, it, which is one of the most difficult tasks probably on Earth. I didn't know this before I got involved is to convince professors in universities that what they do, research, it would be nice if it, if it could be applied in real life and solve actual problems. One of the major purpose, one of the ma major efforts of our research, uh, our, 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 our effort is to take this research from universities and take it all the way through to solve everyday pro problems. And in doing so, we need to transfer technology and transfer knowledge from our advanced partners like UCL and uh, Max Planck to our local partners, which are the three state universities in Cyprus, and transfer that knowledge then into the market. I know it sounds so easy. It's very difficult to do and it takes time. And that, and that is... Um, and that is why the um, new European innovation agenda uh, comes to help in the sense that funding is provided and we plan to uh, use it in, uh, in creating uh, more, uh, in creating opportunities for further uh, cooperations with institutions, with universities in attracting talent from the US, and since our model has succeeded, I think it has succeeded, this model of cooperation, I think it can be expanded to include institutions from the United States, include, institution, include uh, universities from the United States, and definitely attract talent from the United States to come to Europe. And I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. So, if I can make a very short summary of what was said here, in Europe we have a lot of diversity with respect to innovation, and that's a strength. Yeah? And we have this new European innovation agenda, which is giving a common framework, a common language, so that we can all work, to wor work together towards our ambitions goals. Yeah? And of course we want the US to be partners in this uh, uh, process as well. So, we certainly have some questions, but I think it's time now for you, the audience, to ask questions to these uh, excellent people. So don't be shy. Questions? We were very clear. Yes. The lady, there is, I think there's a microphone somewhere walking around, right? Is there no microphone walking around? Yes. I'm actually attending on behalf of some of the companies I've invested in who address um, climate change as well as new drugs that can be introduced to um, replace antibiotics, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think what's difficult is to understand how to navigate, like where is the starting point to have those conversations and then figure out where you should go and how do you make those decisions along the way. So that's, you know, if, if you've already built the navigation system on the website, mm -hmm. terrific. But I think understanding that first step is really important. Yes, I understand your question. I, I think it's important. Who wants to answer to that? Mark, yes? So I think um, I'll give you two answers. If you're looking as a company to look at European regulations, so for example, the European Medicines Agency, the EMEA, 
has a dedicated team for uh, small companies that uh, explains part of the regulations. It explains how to navigate those regulations, explains what you have to do. It has a discount if you're a small company. It's very like what the FDA have. It's just the European equivalent. The Food Safety Authority, the same thing. So for all of those regulatory bodies, they have in place a, a, a group of people that is dedicated to helping small companies look at the regulations, wherever the small companies come from, whether they're from Europe, United States, or wherever. Uh, the European Innovation Council, the program managers that actively manage the programs, actually are a fount of knowledge as to where to signpost people to. So there is a person in food, there's a person in pharmaceuticals, and so on, and they can point you in that direction. If you're looking at funding, if you're thinking about establishing a company in Europe, so not just navigating the regulations, then I think um, you can look at the websites, for example, of EIT, you can look at EIC, they're a good place. There's a, a QR code listed yesterday for the, uh, for the inventory of looking, and, and then you can start. But certainly from the European Innovation Council's perspective, if you talk to any of the program managers and you'll see their pictures and their names and their phone numbers and their emails and everything about them on the website, uh, they're like a kind of ARPA managers, so they're there to help small companies uh, navigate both the, um, the funding and the regulatory system. That would be my advice. Okay, perfect. I see Nora wants I, to add to something. To I, that. I'll just add on that one, Mark. So um, what's interesting with, let's say with the IT, what they've done is that they've segmented yeah. uh, the industry into pockets. So health would be the closest to what you were mentioning there, which is drug development. So EIT health would have an understanding of the um, regulatory framework, uh, the funding, so helping you know raise funding um, and helping navigate the entire system. Um, so you know, if you were in a different area, if you were in manufacturing, you'll approach EIT manufacturing. But this one specifically is EIT Health. They have all the big pharmaceutical companies working with them as well, um, as well as the regulatory and the and all the science and academics in in that world as well. So it's a good way to step into the system in Europe is navigating through those pockets uh, with industry kind of uh, understanding. Um, and then I think it's, it's also important to say from a regulatory perspective, I've seen it happen with a company in Europe that I know pretty well. So they were in the insect, very different industry. They were in the insect area where they were growing insects for animal feed moving into human uh, health, uh, human, human consumption. And, and actually, um, they, they approached EIT, I, I'm thinking it was EIT food, but I'm not sure which EIT, but they approached one of the EITs that helped them regulate it. So they helped them talk to governments, and actually the EU has now allowed insect consumptions for humans. Uh, and that was a big step for Europe. So, you know, these different pockets, I think, can be helpful. You just need to identify with them and, and connect with them. Does this answer your question? Do you know how, who to contact now? Um, well, if within your own research company is a matter of resources, so ha sorry, having someone to guide you through is the critical piece. So I think yeah. if you're describing these organizations as being like a consultant firm that actually guides you through the process, if you're telling a younger company to go be a subject matter expert or figure out how to be a subject matter expert in navigating that, they're probably not going to do it. They're just going to hire someone who can. And so that, that's sort of my, where is the bridge into actually figuring it out as opposed to you know, spending a year, 18 months in the process? Well, this group, for example, with the IT Health as an example, they'll, they'll help it for free. So yeah. they, they want to they wanna attract new ideas in. So, um, so it's just a matter of connecting with them. OK. The for free part was indeed an important uh, aspect of your response. There's to a certain point. <laughs> yes. Hi, just, just, sorry, yes. about, just a quick follow up. Um, is I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So my name is Sarah, and I happen to be a member here. If you know, if, if and I'll stick around. Uh, I I'm actually English, even though I don't sound it. Um, born in London, I spent a lot of time there. But I live here, and I work for a telemed for women's reproductive health. So basically, acne to menopause, growing at three x particularly because of Roe and telemed. So we're growing rapidly. We are currently US-based, but looking to expand outside the US. My question is, I'm just trying to figure out, for right now, let's say we're just exclusively US-based. Would there be investors in your networks 
that we should be talking to and how would we get to them? It's a self-serving question, but I'm sure probably other people here have the same question. No. Do you want to go first? Or? I don't mind. I, I'll throw it at you, Mark. Okay, all right, no problem. So um, if you're looking at uh, venture capital in Europe, there are obvious... Or angel investors. Or angel investors. Okay, so there's sort of two levels of answer uh, to your question. One is at the European level, and the second is at the member state, at the country level. So if you were thinking of going to Ireland or to France or to Germany or, or to Norway or whatever, each of those countries will have different programs. So since I'm from Ireland, I can tell you there's an Irish network of angel investors. Uh, they consolidate deals. Uh, they can invest some significant sums of money, and that's not unique to Ireland. That's true in many European countries. So at the country level, when you've decided which country you would like to go to, there will be uh, organizations within those countries that will do that. There are clearly international venture capitalists, and then there are European venture capitalists. Each country will have a venture capital organization. There is a European venture capital organization. You can look at it on the website. It tells you its members. Uh, it tells you what they're interested in investing in. That's a kind of good signpost. If you're going to the UK, there's the British one. If you're going to Irish, there's the Irish one and the German one and so on and so forth. The country ones tend to have more granular detail. They tend to cover smaller investors, whereas the European ones tend to be the bigger funds. So that's the first uh, answer. Um, within the European system, so within the uh, EIC, for example, where we invest, we always co-invest. And so there are, is a panel of over 200 uh, co-investors that will co-invest with the EIC. Uh, so if you were coming and you were uh, wanting to be a, a potential applicant to the European Innovation Council, then you get in touch with that network of individuals. Those are people that we work with. It's not an exclusive club, so it's always growing. But we actually do quite a lot of due diligence on the funds because we are investing European taxpayers' money and there are certain folks that we will not co-invest with. Um, for example, people mentioned the Ukraine war earlier. So, so this is uh, an authenticated group of investors that we work with. Um, so that's a way in. Look at the, look at the, uh, at the individual uh, venture capitals, look at the European level decide what company, uh, country you're going to locate in, and then take it from there. And there will be loads of people to help. There are loads of national agencies uh, that will help you uh, navigate that. And I can tell you a great deal about Ireland if you want to come to Ireland, but it would not be appropriate at this occasion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I actually, on Ireland, so I, w when I moved, it was to Ireland. Uh, the, that's where I built the biotech. Um, and there, for example, you have local um, government agencies like Enterprise Ireland, and they, they're one of the largest investors in Europe, so they do invest in early. And then you go from there, like with the VCs, et cetera, and from a, uh, an EIT perspective, again, I think you're related to health, um, that would be a good network to be in because they do co-invest, and they do early investments, and they follow through. So. I, I don't know the particulars, um, but, uh, in terms of investment, there needs to be some sort of uh, European angle to it, a launch or something. But I, again, I can't, I can't speak specifically on that. I think touching base with them would be great. So the venture capital community will be various as to where they invest in geographies. I can tell you for the European Innovation Council, you must be a European company. Okay, let me be very clear. We're deploying European taxpayers' money. We expect a base in Europe. We expect people to employ people in Europe, and we expect them to grow in Europe. We also expect them to be global. We'd like to have operations in wherever, in, in America, in wherever. It's, it's absolutely appropriate. But for the governmental, the European Union uh, organizations like EIC, this is European taxpayers' money. We want you to be based in Europe, but we'd be delighted if you're going to have operations in America or all over the world. But what you can't do is take European investment, uh, European taxpayers' money and put it someplace outside Europe. That's not what we're about. Okay. Because, because there is so the European level and there is a regional level, I don't know if someone of the other panelists, yes? Uh, yeah. Just a short answer. Uh, if you are thinking about um, investing in Europe, um, Ireland is a good option, but the weather is much better. <laughs> but Spain is better. <laughs> 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 
I, you can be sure of that. And, and the food is even better. The weather is so, definitely better. So, <laughs> Ireland is great. I love the Irish people, but please invest in Spain and in particular in Castile. Now, j jokes apart, uh, we have a uh, specific office uh, of, uh, it's called the Economic uh, Competitiveness in Institute that helps uh, companies uh, with a business plan, with the financing, with the guarantees. They look for you uh, industrial parks where you can install. So if you are really interested, we can offer you uh, a meeting now and, and we can talk shortly uh, about your case. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions <laughs> from the audience? No one? Then, because we have a little bit of time, I, I, I see it right there because behind this pillar I don't see very well. So maybe I would like to ask the panelists, so we're here in the Silicon Valley, what would be your dream outcome from, from your visit here? Yeah? And so, you know, just a few, uh, your gut feeling. So what would be your dream outcome of your trip here? So, Mark. Okay, uh, so I think the dream outcome would be that uh, American investors uh, would look to European uh, companies to co-invest and we are very welcoming of you to the EIC. We have a lot of uh, American investors who we co-invest with. I think if American entrepreneurs look to Europe um, uh, either to open an operation in Europe, even better, to start a company in Europe, that would be great. And then I think cooperation. I mean, we're all looking at societal and economic challenges, and so there will be collaborative opportunities, both for companies and for uh, researchers, to look to solve common problems, particularly societal problems like climate change, agri-tech, whatever. Uh, so, a lot of that. Okay, thank you, Mark. Juan. For us, of course, it would be a dream that uh, many uh, American companies and startups and entrepreneurs uh, decide to come to Castilla y Leon and invest there. Mm -hmm. Also, there could be a good cooperation between co American companies and European ones. Uh, we are a region committed with a new European innovation agenda, and there are many opportunities to invest in renewable energies, in new forms of mobility, and all the things that we have been talking in this uh, round table. We have excellent people, very talented, with good universities, and I think it would be a great decision to come to Castilla y Leon and have there a platform that would be the perfect bridge between Europe, America, and Africa. So come and invest. <laughs> okay, Tanya. <laughs> Well, I think dreams are dreams when they are translated into mm -hmm. concrete objectives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that these days, uh, especially with the European Innovation Day, we have extremely concrete objectives ahead of us. And on European level, and including the collaboration uh, with the United States, I believe that the next coming years will be enriched with very concrete initiatives that will affect the both mm -hmm. innovation systems uh, on the both sides of the Atlantic. And on European level as well, I believe that the diversity of our countries and uh, the uniqueness of the talents that we have will be something very important for the success of this initiative, which will finally, I'm sure, will address the societal challenges and will pro provide for the recipes that will definitely improve our quality of living. And I'm dreaming of uh, reaching the moment when we will never experience wartime periods like we have unfortunately now in Europe. And of course, because I'm coming from a very talented and beautiful country, and it is located on the peninsula, on the Balkan Peninsula, and my city is very hard at the center of uh, our country, but we have also other very beautiful regions, I will be very happy to convince those who are willing to enjoy the opportunity to develop the new entrepreneurial initiatives in our country and especially in uh, my municipality. And we can promise that we will support those businesses that will dare to do that in every aspect because this is one of our main priority to attract investors and to support them with the 
very high quality services that we have to be uh, providing being local authorities. So I think that this is a very crucial moment that will be followed by concrete and very positive results. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Tanya. Nora. Thank you. I think the dream is really becoming a reality. I think if you look around, especially after COVID, I think COVID has, has helped the whole ecosystem in the US to realize that there's, there's an outside world as well and there's huge good science and good technology out there. And actually you don't need to be in close proximity to someone to invest. And I think, I think that helped significantly. And we can see the trend already. So we see that in, in, there's a lot more VCs from US actually investing in Europe, which is actually really, really interesting. Uh, I give the example of Nertas, 95 plus percent of our investment comes from the US, which is really interesting. And, and I know a lot of companies in this space. I, another a good example, Perfect Day, they're a unicorn. Um, they uh, came from here, they moved to Ireland uh, where they got seed round, seed investment, and they developed their biotech company, and then they they grew it uh, and, and and grew it in the U.S. later on. But there's a lot of these examples more and more today, both from an investment perspective, and also what I what I dream the most of is is you see the numbers always Europe moving to the U.S. and growing. Um, it would be great to see the numbers reverse a little because the ecosystem like here and it's well presented is, is already there uh, and it's ripe to, to, to really use it like EIT and, and all the different kicks. Um, so, and I'd like to actually thank uh, also uh, Commissioner Gabrielle for that vision and pushing that vision forward because it's really, really important as well. So thank you. Okay, Constantinos. Yeah. Well, uh, what's... Um uh, what we're seeing now in uh, Cyprus, in Nicosia, but in Cyprus in general, is that a lot of uh, either larger companies are opening branches or smaller companies are moving to Cyprus. And actually, the reason is quite simple. If you exclude the very, very low tax regime that exists now for companies, it's only 12.5%. Uh, and if you happen to a transfer your IP asset, uh, you have an 80% reduction that would take your corporate tax down to 2.5%, which is amazing. And also employees, non-domiciled employees from 55,000 upwards get a 50% reduction uh, in, in taxation. Though that's one part, but the real reason when we get surveys of why people move to Cyprus, it's the easy life. There is no commuting because distances, you know, size, or, I mean, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good. In this case, size is, uh, the small size of Cyprus provides a lot of advantages. There's no commuting. It's amazingly safe. Uh, social life is incredible because you can either winter ski or uh, go to the sea in the same month probably and within half an hour. There are amazing schools. Everybody in Cyprus, everybody speaks English. Uh, and you have a plethora that could be an advantage or a disadvantage, but you have a plethora of lawyers and uh, accountants. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's, uh, and it's, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't say which, I mean, you laughed. <laughs> I, I, um, and all in all, it, uh, it's a very, very good quality of life with many advantages. Uh, tax-wise, and I think this would be um, uh, uh, this would be a success for me if some, not a lot at first, some small companies uh, from the U.S. chose to move there to put a foothold in uh, Europe because coming to Cyprus, although it's in the very eastern part of the Mediterranean, it is part of Europe and it's in the middle of the Middle East. You have the Middle East, Asia, Africa, uh, uh, and you're still in Europe. So a few companies, small ones or even bigger ones, to open a small branch, that would be a success. Perfect. Thank you so much. So to finalize, I, I think you, we feel that on both sides of the Atlantic, there is a sense of urgency that we need to innovation to address our big challenges. In Europe, we are very committed to implement the European innovation agenda, and we really look forward to our U.S. Uh, 
uh, partners to work with us. So let this be the one thing that you remember from this session, and I would like to thank my excellent panel members. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jan. That was a great panel. I agree with all of that. I'm very excited for this next panel because as a female founder, I understand the difficulties and the challenges here, and I'm hoping that the EU can solve some of that investing um, with a little more equity. So next we have the women investors in the US and the European Union. Our moderator today, Anna Panagopoulou. Did I, did I get it? Did I get it? I'm almost perfect. What is it? Panagopoulou. That is correct. You win 100 <laughs> euro. There we go. All right. This is the Director of European Research Area and Innovation Policy, the Directorate General and Research and Innovation EU. I'm excited to listen to your panel and thank you very much. And good afternoon to everyone. I'm really excited. This is my first time in Silicon Valley. And yes, yes. And despite, I, I would like to introduce myself in a different way. I studied uh, electrical engineering many years ago. So I'm a woman in STEM, where again, we have very low percentage that we try to increase, and our commissioner is very much behind that as well. But today, we are here to share experiences with you, not just about innovation, we said a lot about that, but what we can do to promote more women in innovation. And what I see in this room, we have quite a lot of women. Uh, despite the fact that we know women in innovation and women in investors are much lower than men, this is a men-dominated area. I think we all agree about that. But here today we have a lot of women. And I also noticed that most of the questions, they are coming from women as well. Which means that the women want to improve, women want to succeed, and this is a challenge both in Europe and both in the US. So now you understand why we have this session today. It's not only because it's very much in the heart of our Commissioner Maria Cabriel. It's not only because it's very much one of the priorities that we have in the new European innovation agenda. It's also because it matters also for US. And we want really to share the experiences that you have with the experience that we have, and also to share ideas about solutions that we have to give to promote more women in innovation in tech, and also to promote more investments, more women investors in innovation, and more investments for human, women innovators. So, with these words, I would like to invite to this fantastic panel, first of all, Commissioner Maria Cabriel, you all know by now, is Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education, and Youth. So, it represents all the spirit of innovation around the table. And then with us, we have Kinka, with a Polish different, a difficult name, Stanislavska. Is it correct? Great. So, Kinka, she's an investor from a country which I hope you all know, Poland, an important country which she's managed to do an amazing work for not just for investing as a co-founder of an important VC in Poland, but also for women investors. So Kinga, very happy to have you with us today. Then, uh, you know someone, probably you know you from the US very well, Samira Q. Curtis, G. Curtis, Samira? She's an investor in Silicon Valley, but at the same time, she's the head of the EIT office here with us in Silicon Valley. And last but not least, because then you think we are biased, we have only women in the panel for the moment. So we need a man. And the hero for this panel is Chusi Hachanen. I hope Finnish, huh? yeah. yeah. I hope it's correct. He is the head of the EIC unit in the European Investment Bank. But why you see is with us, because he has been working for almost 13 years in the bank, trying to develop a lot of products to invest on innovation, and he can share his experience from his side. So this is the panel today, and I will start with our commissioner. The first question 
Commission, dear Commissioner, you said to us today that women in innovation is in your heart. It is one of your main policies that you want to deliver as well. Why you think, and you share with us, why it's important to have more women in technology and in innovation? Well, thank you very much, dear Anna. I will start with some numbers. Three quarters of startups in Europe are funded but by all men teams, while only 8% are funded by all women teams. Only 9% of capital raised by tech companies goes to mixed gender founding teams, while 90% goes to all male teams. And only 1.1% of capital raised by tech companies went to all women founding teams. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that we have to every one of us, we can say, no way. We need definitely to change this. We need to make a difference. So that's why it's important. It's a necessity because this is not just a question of justice. Having more women in innovation and in, in tech, that means simply unlock the potential that we need if you'd like to achieve our ambitions. How can we invest in 50% of our population via education trainings and not to have them when the time is coming to show their talent, to show, the, to develop their ideas? So for me, it's important to invest in women to unlock this potential and to giving us much more chances to succeed because we have other numbers. 84% of all startups are more efficient if they have more women in their teams. So I think that we have to be able, every one of us, that this entire innovation community, to show that this efficiency and this added value, we can have it with women. So that's why I have one, one single demand. Let's this time make a difference. Let's join beautiful words with concrete actions. And let's really tell to all the others, we don't have time. We need to act now. Thank you very much. We need to act now, Juicy. You have been in the bank investing to innovation. But why this happens? Why we don't have more investments to women? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I can tell you why we want to invest more into women and we always look for ways to, to find female entrepreneurs, female uh, innovators in the market. Now, I mean, I was grown up in a family where, where my mother was an entrepreneur and an innovator, a CEO, and my father was a teacher, so kind of the mixed roles, what you would expect in the 80s. Now, naturally, I can give you 101 reasons why I think uh, women should be, should be founders and innovators. Now, reflections from what we have done now most recently is that if we look at the portfolio we have currently at EIC, it's 350 companies. I would say roughly 20% only of those are, are women founded and we can come back to why uh, but but why what we see in the portfolio is that actually the companies founded by women truly solve real societal problems it's not about how to get a taxi faster or platforms how to watch more tv or or shooting pigs with slingshots no it's real societal problems so they they try to solve problems in the world so if we want to solve problems in the world we need more women innovators secondly if we want to solve these problems better we also need women innovators. Now, we have seen that many times women actually address problems differently and actually, and they come conclude into to fantastic solutions. As a good example, we, we closed a transaction a few weeks ago, I believe, uh, for a PTSD solution, so effectively mental disorders, which has been always treated with drugs. And, and the man approach would be, okay, let's develop different drugs or give more drugs. But the women thought that why don't we tra train the brain to treat with the illness. Mm -hmm. So effectively, do an invasive style way of thinking of how to address this problem. Now, last week they got their FDA approval. So if you see this solution, if you have relatives uh, seeing being treated with these uh, important aspects of, of mental illness, I mean, you can only thank a women innovator who truly thought differently how to solve a problem. Finally, why we need women innovators? Diversity. I, I think diversity is key. It's, it's the power that drives teams. It's the power that drives companies. We need more women innovators to match with the men. So it's not only having all women team, but I think it's truly a power of having diversity in the teams that, that kind of drives the companies and is a 
let's say, recipe for success. But I think those are the tr three reasons. So effectively, if we want to solve any problem, we need women. So thank As a you conclusion. very much. So I think uh, you hear what he said, you see. If you want to solve any problem, we need women. And we need more women. So very important message. Kinka. You have been trying a lot. I know you, the last two years that we have been working together, you really try a lot. Huh? And why you do that? Why do you believe to women? Well, my number one inspiration are my two teenagers, uh, girls. And I would not want them to go through what I go through every day. Uh, I want them to be able to have fair and open access to capital. I want them to be treated in a fair and meritocratic way. And I don't want them to be put in uncomfortable situations when they're talking to investors. I want them to be able to succeed on what they're learning, on their determination and their hard work. And I think that is the biggest motivator. I think in general, kids do motivate us all to do various things. Uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of is, you know, everything around sustainability. That's also something that these days kids learn in school and bring back home. It's a beautiful thing because all of a sudden families segregate litter and use glass bottles and, and all these different things. So it's wonderful how the young generation, and of course the commissioner is also responsible for the youth segment, um, how they implement things that they see as important, how climate change for them is a priority, and then bring that back to us. So that is absolutely beautiful. And that's something that I, I have to say I'm very proud of. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on a few points that my predecessors mentioned. I think, you know, today we are at a very difficult situation globally. Um, we have gone through a pandemic. We have energy issues, we have different challenges all around the world. And indeed, it's a fact that women tend to spend their income on families, so on kids, education, the elderly, on health, and everything that is around the home. So therefore, if we are developing solutions that address those problems and financing those solutions, we're actually making society better, we're making the world better. And that is exactly what we should be doing because we have scarce resources. Uh, money isn't endless. EIC is a big project, but it can't do everything. And so if we want to have a society where we feel happy, where our kids are safe and educated, our elderly are taken care of, we're breathing fresh air and we have green energy, then it is many of the female innovators that are leading those companies. This is why we need the women there. And as UC said, there are some wonderful, wonderful examples in the portfolio of EIC Fund that have these female innovators doing these wonderful things. We need more of them. I know the commissioner has been very hard pushing the level, the percentage levels for the female innovators to come forward. And maybe we can grow the 20% to 40%. Let's see. Great. So the message for me is more women innovators for sustainability and happiness, if I may say from what you said. So, yes, I agree. Samira, you are in the valley, Silicon Valley. And I don't know, you heard the European experiences. Do you feel or see the same? And what is for a woman to be in Silicon Valley? So I just actually have some facts that I want to I want to read also on BCG because of the from the woman investment. I want to get to the hardcore numbers though. We are not only on sustainability. There are facts. BCG was uh, in 2018 showed us that uh, women actually equally perform outperform as a male in investments. In and, and we actually have sometimes female, founder, female investors that are outperforming. So, uh, and, and this is just not looking at sustainability because as you know, in Silicon Valley, we're behind when it comes to sustainability. This is just a hardcore investment. And, and, and the other fact is that when you look at to ROI and, and return on investment, that women are much more uh, um, you know, capital efficient, by the way. 
So, uh, and, 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 and that's, that's the number that was uh, the percentage that every dollar that you give to a woman, it's a, you, they would bring you 78 cents and then by the man would be 30 cents. So, I mean, uh, the numbers are showing that, that uh, women are just extremely successful. Uh, I think the, the, the challenge what we have is just we just need to create that environment for them. So it's just the matter, it's not a matter of if who's better or better. I think we are definitely at this stage, we are equally as a man in this space when it comes to investing successfully. Great, so we are equally. Uh, Sometimes outperform. Outperform, <laughs> yes. Nevertheless, and that brings me to the next question, and I'm looking at UC as well. So, um, there are challenges for women to raise investments. There are challenges. In Europe, there are challenges in the US. So why all these challenges? And what do we need to do to address those challenges for women innovators and for women in investment? Again, very good question. I mean, if I would have the crystal ball to, to understand why, why women struggle to, to raise funds, whether it's about having female investors, and that's also something that has been flagged that there should be more female investors. Now, naturally, for that, we are taking serious action, of course, as EIB, we promote inclusion, diversity. Um, when we started to build up the EIC team after we concluded the agreement with the commission that the EIB would take it over and, and manage the equity side, we have built from scratch a 30 people team. We have 42% of women in our team. Uh, so effectively that's a team of 13, actually 14 next month. So, so we are almost 50-50 on diversity and not because, uh, I mean, there's a policy on diversity, but we truly believe that this diversity builds the team and then the efficiency of the team. Now, actually, to our surprise, I mean, just to quote facts, I mean, we have strict rules as any public institution on, on promoter, promoting people and, 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 and giving them marks. So we had four top performers, three were women. We had four promotions last year, three were women. Our women are managing a portfolio of one billion deep tech investments. So that's what they are managing. And I, I truly see that the EIC is a, is a fantastic way to incubate future female leaders in the VC industry. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and I, I would be proud to say in five years time, if one of my team members, although how fantastic they are, would leave, go out and raise their own fund. That would be a success for me. And I think that's something we need. I mean, it's, it's been a male's world. And I think we need to just build the new future of female leaders also to the VC space. And hopefully this kind of uh, discrepancy in, in females having on the other side raising funds will be solved at least to one, some extent through that. Great. Thank you for the very open-minded approach you see, in all sense. So, um, and five years, no, I say in three years time, we will have one KPI about women raising, uh, we have already the KPI mark, I think. Huh? We have already the KPI, women raising in uh, EIC instrument. Let's follow closely this KPI. Samira, US, Silicon Valley, why? Is it the same situation here? Do you have, you are an investor, are there problems to raise investments for women? I think there is a problem everywhere, right? So we, we, we can't avoid that there is definitely more challenging for the female to raise funds as a also VC fund. So as you know, I was running a syndication fund for two years. So uh, it's definitely tough, but I, uh, I must say that um, there is more diversity here in the United States. There is more access to capital in the United States, and that might make it a little bit more easier for women comparing to, to Europe still. And also, generally, uh, venture capital is much more uh, mature, of course, right? We, have, we still have in Europe more, more, more bankers that they're coming to the venture capital. And I think there is a lot of exchange that we could do with the United States when it comes to that the space. So, but as female, yes, I mean, we are all facing that challenge, but I feel like we are a little bit ahead when it comes comparing, but that's generally on the venture capital space. So not only on a female side. Great, thank you very much. So similar challenges, despite the more opportunities in US for the moment, because as you know, the commissioner came here to explain what are the opportunities in you, EU also for innovation. And then I would like to turn to you, dear commissioner. And my question to you is, you are leading AIC, you are leading AIT. So what we should do 
in order to improve the situation or investments to women? Well, maybe I, I will talk a little bit more as European Union because I think that there is a three, at least three, three, four, four different levels. First, maybe one thing that will be a little bit provocative, but I think that every one of us can play a role. Very simple. In 2018, I launched the campaign No Women, No Panel. I'm refusing to participate in an event where I'm the only one woman. And believe me, When you send your answer showing what is the reason behind, suddenly, three, four, five hours later, the organizers discovered a lot of women experts that will participate. So I think that these small actions, but with real added value, can help a lot. Don't hesitate. Second, I think that we are doing extraordinary things with EIC and EIT. And we have only concrete examples from Women Tech EU to Women to Invest. But it's really important always to link this topic with what we can do with young girls and with mm -hmm. education. Because when we arrive at this stage to innovate, create company, already a lot of problems, obstacles, bias are here. So I think that we need really always to establish a bridge and to see how we can encourage much more girls to have this entrepreneurial mindset and to dare. That's why it's good what we have with the EIT, our project Girls Go Circular. We are offering training for girls between 14 and 19. And of course, our objective is to, 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 to provide this training for 40,000 girls. It's not enough. We need 100,000. So I think that that's the second, uh, the second thing. The third, definitely we need much more institutional changes. And what I'm, I'm talking about, for the first time in the New Horizon Europe program, and we all heard at the beginning 95.5 billion euros the budget, we introduced as an eligibility criteria for the selected project to have a gender equality plan. But not only to submit this beautiful paper in the beginning, but to have a monitoring how every year all the different organizations are implementing it. And I must say that this year, for the first time, we awarded our first champions. Sorry, that was again our universities. Where are the companies coming from the big partnerships and all this big money from the second pillar of the Horizon Europe program? So I think that it's really important to send this signal coming from different institutional levels. Final point, I think that all the time, not only on the occasion of the 8th of March, we need really information campaigns to give much more visibility to these three wonderful women that are the top performers, to those that are really doing extraordinary things. And that's what we try to do with my team. Actually, for a third consecutive year, we have an information campaign, always with a specific topic. And this year, the topic is Women Innovate. But every week, we are showcasing an extraordinary woman coming from different regions or different member states. And believe me, it's really important because when I started this campaign, one of the first messages that I received via private message on one of my social media, it was, why are you talking about these unknown people? Come on, you need, we need really to break the stereotypes. And suddenly the same persons, four, five, six, Weeks later, I saying, it's great. Can we establish a contact with her? Because in our team, we are looking for a specialist. So you can see this, this change. So I will stop here. You can see that this, this topic is really important for me. But that's my message that every one of us, every single day, can, can react. Great. And I have to say, I'm so I'm happy that I'm not 14, how much? 14 to 20 years old to be able to participate to this training, which probably would have given me the opportunity not to work in the Commission, but to be an entrepreneur. That would have been great. And please follow Commissioner Gabriel, because probably you will find a new partner that you don't know. And I do agree, we need to communicate about these success stories. These unknown people tomorrow may be the most known people in the world. Let's support them, let's follow them. Kinka, I come to you. What is your experience, and in general, 
your response to the question, but also in particular because you are the one who established, together with Commissioner Gabriel, this European Women in Venture Capital, the community. And what are the challenges for you to establish this community? And why this community? Well, when I first uh, built a venture fund with another lady, um, we could not really find any women around Europe who were doing venture. It wasn't very simple. And we thought, well, it would be good to share pipelines, share experiences, and, and just get them together. So we had to look around for them. And we found that they do exist. Uh, it's just that maybe they don't uh, show themselves so often in the media. Maybe they're not so visible. Um, but we got them together and we started to do meetups and, and podcasts to try to promote them because we felt that this is a good way of getting together, sharing, uh, sharing our experiences. And then COVID came and of course this was no longer possible. So we decided to figure out what are the needs of Europe to understand better why there are so few female investors. And, and what we found was we started to do research. We found that 9% of assets under management are in the hands of females. And that there is a systemic problem. Uh, so of course, the, the problem starts right at the top with asset allocators who do have a gender criteria somewhere in, in their decision making, but it's not an important one. And so, in fact, they may ask questions about the gender diversity of the team, but they don't dig deep into these issues. So they don't think about ownership of the general partnership. They don't think about carry splits. They don't think about the details that actually then make these women successful, also financially, and be able to give back as investors to female-led startups, which is often the case. Because if you have successful women who lead VC funds, they are very likely to invest in the next generation of women founders. And so um, really what we found was that there are a lot of women interested in this topic who are emerging managers, first time, second fund managers, because, well, in the old days there were even fewer than the 9%. And they really want relationships with LPs. So now every week we have a weekly meet the LP call where on Zoom we meet one LP who talks about their pathway to becoming an investor, who talks about their thesis, who talks about how to best approach them if you're an emerging manager and how to start building a relationship. And on the other side, we have around 30 general partners on every call who are super, super interested to learn more. They would love to meet US investors, US LPs on these calls. So if anyone knows anyone who'd be interested to take part, they're very, very welcome. And the idea is to break the barriers, mm -hmm. to just show to the women that these LPs are accessible, that they, they, you know, they have email addresses, um, that they can be approached in such and such a way that they are a good candidate for a first close of a fund or a second close to know when to go and approach them and how. And these are all really critical pieces of information because as women are raising funds, it takes an awful long time to learn. And so the learning process actually costs time and money mm -hmm. and women need to cut that short, as short as possible. So we're trying to do these little things, you know, one work is the data work, which we have also done with the commissioner last year, which we will do again this year. Um, and we're hoping to launch it in Copenhagen at Tech Barbecue in September. So everyone Tech is- Barbecue. Yes, everyone is very much invited to Copenhagen. Um, that's another nice city. <laughs> we haven't spoken about Denmark today, and, uh, <laughs> but you're all very welcome. Um, so we will do look at data again. Uh, but for us, this LPGP relationships are super, super key to allow the female managers to just bring more capital to them so they can execute their investment thesis. They're doing great jobs. They have great thesis, but they need the capital to be there. So it's, it's all about, you know, putting more money in the hands of women. Great. So before I continue with the panel, I turn to you. There are investors around the table. There are women in this room who would like to share his her experience. And don't be shy. Yes, please. 
Hi, my name is Maura. Um, I worked in venture for a few years here. I'm a direct investor. I look at the European startup ecosystem because I think that's the place where there's a lot of value. I'm originally Irish, so you know that might have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say, I'm actually quite inspired by what I'm hearing from the panelists because part of the problem, actually this morning, I had a, a meeting with the, the head of a VC who started her own fund because eight years ago, she was told in the Valley, you don't fit the prototype for an investor here. Mm -hmm. You know, that may, means that you're not 20 and from Stanford. That's the reality. Um, so I love to hear that the EIB, because it's really important, the investment committee, who are actually making the decisions where the money goes to, A. Eh? And the other thing is, if you think about what has worked really well, and hats off to all the guys in the room, is old guys' networks. And how they work is about education and shared incentives. I think that's key. And us as women, we have to also share incentives. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It means sharing deal flow. It means that we all support each other. And yes, it's great to have a network of executives, but as soon as you hear pro bono, that kills it. We are experts, we know how to scale companies, we know how to invest in companies. And women also have to be rewarded for their time. So I think more of the collaboration across the US and in Europe, and like we can create women networks and we can share incentives and we can connect startups to the proper investors but we also need to actually look to who taught us how to do this really well, and that's men. So that's my piece of advice. Kinka, any reactions to this piece of advice? Well, uh, I mean, I agree that it's actually all about, you know, finding the right networks, but it's also working together with the male colleagues. And I think, you know, this is, this is key. It's not that uh, women are sort of an isolated group that all of a sudden needs to build everything on its own. No, we want to work together. We actually want to have diversity and inclusion. That's what we want. Uh, and also what you see said, the best startups are built by mixed teams. That, that's so what a diverse team, just yeah, like women, diverse. men, I think that's, that's the still today as an investor, right? We are looking to the diversity. It's just not necessarily like that they're female. I mean, we're trying to give the numbers on a female side, but I think it's just the diversity is the key. My co-founders are just male and I have a team of diverse as well. Like, uh, you know, and all, I have a Stanford and I have someone who just has been in a startup scene. So, I mean, it's the diversity is the key. So it's not about... Uh, you know, it, I, I, as, as long as you can just pick the right people that you feel they have the empathy, they have the passion, and, 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 and you, they have a different vision than you, and I think that's some of the keys, and, and for sure diversity, I agree with you. Yeah, I think on diversity, um, as you are an investor in a startup, or actually in any project, you have to constantly think about de-risking, and diversity is a way of de-risking. It's because people have different views, people have, they're different ages, they're, they're different experiences, they're different backgrounds, and they're different genders. But it's all about de-risking, and diversity of the team is just an amazing way to be able to do it. I think diversity is important, but I think also sharing experience between women is also important, because that encourages us in this male environment, but I would like to have the opinion of a male, a man here in the room. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'll say two things. Um, first of all, there's a, science, oops, there's a science on this subject. And what the science says is that women are more thoughtful than men. So if you, if you, if you take, um, uh, a problem, uh, then a typical alpha male will say, yeah, of course, give me the money and I can solve that. And a woman will be much more thoughtful of that. And, and because of that, what the science says is that women don't often assert themselves as much as men. So one of the initiatives that we've done in the European Innovation Council, which has been successful up to a point, is to say that a certain percentage of women 
will make it to the final interview stage. So I repeat, this is not a quota. I don't believe in quotas, but it's giving people a chance at the final stage to be able to pitch their idea because before that, they may have been excluded because they are slightly more thoughtful than some of their male colleagues. Now, what is really interesting about that? It took the percentage success of women applicants from 8% to 20%. 20% is not good enough, but it's better than 8%. So that's the first thing that I would say. You know, we need to look at there are different attributes. These are real science-based, you know, there's studies on this you can look at. And there are actions you can take. But why what I described is important is two other reasons. First of all, those women were awarded the funding not because they were women, but because they had the best projects. So it is really important that the criteria is excellence. All you did was allow them to show that they were excellent. And I think that's really important. So that's one of the things. And the second thing it did was it sent a signal through the system. And the system said, EIC is interested in women. And guess what? The number of women applicants went up. So this is a kind of a feedback through the system that says the funder is interested in women, therefore women should apply. So, so I think that's really important. I think it's really important for us to think about initiatives. I think it's going to be very important for us in the EIC to think about how we go from 20 to 40%. And I think that's going to be more difficult, frankly. You know, we've probably done some of the low-hanging fruit. But then, since I'm from Ireland, I will close with a kind of funny story. And that is that um, in my past life, I was once asked to give a talk on scientific and innovation advances to a retreat of the Archbishops of the Church of England. And I am not a religious person. And I was really puzzled as to why I had received this invitation. But when a famous Archbishop introduced me, he recalled that on a television program, I had responded by saying that I thought that God was a woman. And so he said, <laughs> So he said, I would like to introduce Professor Ferguson, who's the only person I know who thinks that God is a woman. <laughs> so think about that, actually. Think about that. How many of the stereotypes in life do we associate with men, and why do we do that? Um, so I think that's a kind of really important thing to think about in terms of unconscious bias. But my message is there are ways that you can deal with these things. I've just given you one example. No decrease in excellence and an increase in proportion. So, Mark, next year, 30%. Yes. I'm sure we have, to, we have to report the commissioner next year. Someone else who would like to share experience? Yes, please. I would... Hello, my name is Thomas. Um, and Sumira knows this very well, what I'm going to tell everybody. And I see a lot of very young individuals here who just joined a few hours ago. And I want to really encourage, particularly the woman with this younger generation. So, I am from Germany. I came here 32 years ago. I'm an entrepreneur and an investor, and I started two years ago the Transatlantic AI Exchange. And a few women challenged me that it's all men on the video sessions that I have on a monthly basis to educate people from Europe and Silicon Valley uh, about artificial intelligence and entrepreneurship. So four months ago, I teamed up with a professor at Stanford, and she is a woman she studies uh, diversification. And I took on the challenge of a lot of women in my life who said you have to do something and step up. So we are in the middle of a series, it's called Remarkable Woman in AI. And I have to tell you, we had two sessions so far. There are two more to come. They're actually being hybrid between Europe, physically in Europe, people calling from here. But the reason why I'm standing up and telling you the story is as a man, and I have done 22 sessions, the one with the woman, they were the most joyful sessions. The way women communicate with each other, the way they are talking about solutions, like real solutions. And we had women that I invited, the VP for AI for the um, World Economic Forum, an investor, a former Facebook executive. And here comes the killer. I found this girl, the youngest employee ever in the history of Intel, 20 years old. Uh, she finished her bachelor at Harvard at 14. She started at Intel at 14. 
and she finished her master on AI with 19 years old. And what you said f uh, earlier uh, in regards to you refuse to go on panels that are not diverse, as soon as I started to open my eyes and look for this woman, amazing what I found, and it is so good, and I'm inviting every woman here in this room, we are actually extending the series of originally four, because there are so many out there, and people don't know it. So, have an open mind, refuse the status quo, and ask for a change. And you do that. Can you yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ken Finnegan. I'm another Irish in the audience today. There's a lot of, lot of us today. So I run an innovation and entrepreneurial hub in um, one of the seven ancient universities in Great Britain and Ireland, Trinity College in Dublin. And um, so we've already start, started off with a challenge uh, right there. Um, last year, we, uh, the university voted in its first female provost in the history of the university, uh, Dr. Linda Doyle. Um, it's really interesting. I've been totally inspired by the panel today. We run a, um, a Women Who Wow program. So we match female students with um, successful female leaders. And actually, we've even here in Silicon Valley brought um, female um, leaders and matched them with our students. The one thing, the problem, the challenge that I do have, and maybe it's similar to the question that was asked earlier on about um, navigating the system, because we depend on philanthropy and sponsorship for those programs. And I wonder, is, is there like strategic funding? And I know you mentioned for 14 to 19 year olds, but like the females in our program, students go from 19 to or 17 to 24. Is there a way to navigate that system and find out more? We try to do it, but we need we need definitely your help. Yeah. So, because well, you mentioned Trinity College; it's one of our gender equality champions this this year, and I know Linda is doing an amazing job. But we need much more, and as I already said, it we need not only students uh, from this university working with the ecosystem established or in, linked to the university. We need much more, and that's the question: how we can achieve this critical mass? And it, the, the res results are fascinating. Like over 35% of the students that we've mentored have gone on to create their own startups. So, we're, like in terms of the impact of that mentoring program, it's 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 demonstrating. So that was six years ago that program started. Um, our, our accelerator has been running for 10 years, 12% female founders on that accelerator 10 years ago, 45% um, today. So the impact is, is right there. So share your experience and collaborate with other universities, for example, as well, uh, beyond Ireland and UK. That could be a solution. Uh, so maybe I can share. Yes. Hey, everyone. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so my name is Sisi. I come from Bulgaria and I believe I'm everything you mentioned. I'm uh, young. I have a startup in sustainability. I come from Eastern Europe. So basically most of the stereotypes people usually have about female founders, I definitely fit in. And um, I just wanted to say that I really dream of the day when we won't have to say female founders. We are all founders and I really um, never use the fact that I'm a woman when I meet with investors I really am there for my calls and for the mission of my company and I definitely believe that we all together can create the environment for more people like me to to join there not because they are women but because they feel that they can really be accepted in there. And I really want to thank uh, Commissioner Gabriel for the invitation to be here and for the support, uh, because um, you really need a hand sometimes. You really need that small push to go further. And also being um, awarded the impact prize of the European Social Innovation Competition really helped our business in general to move forward. And I believe we got there because of our innovation, not because I'm a woman or we are a team of women. And uh, I really think that in Europe, there is big potential uh, for female founders. So I heard here there are a few of them and also female uh, investors. So I believe uh, you can find uh, great talent there. <laughs> great. So <laughs> you are one of the brilliant examples. 
thank you for this. I don't think we have more time, but I would like... Yes, one, oh, sorry? One yes. More. yes. Yeah. one more. Yeah. One more. It's okay. I'm an old entrepreneur, so I think you can skip me at this point. And I'm also not six feet tall, which is the pretty standard height for a successful VC as well as a founder in the Valley. <laughs> Uh, so I apologize, that's why I got up, maybe, you know, I would be um, a little bit more um, prominent here. So uh, what I wanted to share uh, is my experience. I worked for 15 years at NASA and I left because I felt things were moving way too slow. Um, G-Space, the company that I founded, is a digital platform where we want to deliver microgravity innovation to move into the era of in-space manufacturing for very obvious reasons. Uh, because indust industrial manufacturing is number four pollutant in the world and moving that manufacturing off the surface of the earth into space would be a um, very powerful solution. So um, what I wanted to share here though is my experience as a, as a founder and uh, I'm originally from Romania. I'm grateful for my Romanian heritage. I've been living in the US for 20 years. Uh, I could not have done this in Europe, not just in Romania, in Europe at all. Um, it's difficult here, but in, in, I think in Europe, at least for what I know it and what I've experienced it, it would have been very difficult. Even here, when I pitch investors, I had investors tell me, uh, well, we don't really invest in women because they always prioritize their family and children, for example. And, um, or, uh, you know, you, you girls cannot focus on delivering a certain uh, outcome. I've also seen um, the other side of things where I was told that um, I need to have a male co-founder, that a sole female founder is impossible to be successful. Um, so, I mean, these are indeed stereotypes, but I think what needs to change here is I've noticed by observing um, what works in the ecosystem in order to successfully raise something is to come in with a pitch with an idea, even if you have very little cooked story so a man can do it way much easier and way much faster than a woman. A woman has to cook it 50% and still not be successful. And you know, one of the things that you, you, you hear, hear back as a comment is like, you're not ambitious enough. If you don't sell you know, more than you can actually achieve, you're not ambitious enough. So this is how somehow the system that drives decisions in investment making is driving hype and the hype drives to failure. And I think it's not healthy for the financial start, the, uh, the financial part, the technology solution, their deployments, and the people who actually put effort into uh, promoting successful um, things to the market. So thank you. I don't want to take more time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Dear Commissioner, we don't have a lot of time, but we still have, I think, a minute at least for your reaction oh, and your closing very, of very session. short I, I listened very carefully uh, and thank you very much for your different interventions maybe for, for the last one I, I, I take on board the, 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 the necessary uh, changes or what we, we need to adapt but I don't agree that that will be impossible to do it in Europe I don't agree at all so uh, I think that exactly what we show today is that we have common challenges. Okay, we have success stories. What we need is to give them much more visibility. Of course, that we have to tackle some very specific, I don't know how to say that, elements of the value chain, but that's why we are here. And with all the different interventions today, I think simply that we are not only looking at the same direction, we are on the right way, how to do it all together. And that will be my message. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Europe is not anymore as it was 20 years ago. It, it is much better than before and will be much better in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to this incredible panel. I think, I mean, personally, as someone who likes to highlight innovators who are looking for solution-driven uh, uh, inventions, I, I, I am very inspired by this compelling panel. I love the energy, and I spent the whole time saying, preach, yes! So thank you guys for that. That was amazing. Um, we are ready for our very last panel of the day, if you're ready. 
uh, I would like to talk to you here about the company perspectives. What makes the European Union attractive for startups? I think everybody would like to hear about this. So the moderator I would like to invite on the stage, uh, Jean-David Malou. Are you here? There you are. Uh, coming from stage, right? Director of European Innovation Council, EU. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, good evening now. Uh, to everyone. Um, just for an introduction, I remember the first time I came in this area. I was 20 years old. I was uh, the grandson of a Polish migrant coming in the USA with the stars in my eyes. I was coming and touching the American dream. Um, I'm very happy to be here more than 30 years after um, because in fact what is coming up and I think that you have understood this uh, with the various intervention and previous session is nothing else than a European dream. We believe in Europe that we are able to uh, attract talents, investors, uh, engineers, uh, researchers, innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, with uh, innovation for purpose. And in this session, I have the privilege, in fact, to, um, to have great panelists uh, who will tell you about uh, why, in fact, uh, it's uh, attractive to come in Europe, to invest in Europe, to prepare, in fact, what would be a wonderful European dream for the benefit of the world. So I am delighted to have uh, in this panel um, Miss May Walraven. Uh, so please join me, May, uh, who is uh, the general manager for US of Innova Feed, a French startup. Hello. I have also the privilege to have uh, another great and promising startup, uh, the CEO and founder of Dronamix, Sylvan Rangelov. Sylvan. <laughs> Bulgarian startup. Uh, and of course, uh, I have a third startup, uh, which is uh, IQM. Certainly, you, you heard about IQM. And I have, we have the chance we have to have with us the CEO and co-founder, uh, Jan Gutz. So please join Jan. Um, which is also, by the way, EIC board member. And I would like to, to thank you uh, for this. Startup is a good thing. Uh, but we do believe that what is uh, very important is to look also at the whole innovation uh, environment and ecosystem. So that's why we have decided also in this uh, session to have a large corporate. Because large corporate could play a very key role in this uh, European dream. Uh, and for this, uh, I'm calling Ernesto Ciola, which is the Chief Innovability Officer of Enel. Good evening. So NL Group from Italy. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the Executive Director and Head of Innovation of Volkswagen Group in Germany, uh, Nikolai Arde. So, uh, I just would like to, uh, to start this session by uh, asking you uh, in uh, one word on one sentence, uh, what, according to you, characterizes, in fact, innovation in Europe? What makes Europe unique in this, uh, in this area? So just in one sentence, who would like to start? Jan? Okay. Does this work? No. It works. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, well, my one sentence answer would be also coming from now listening to the previous panel, diversity, because I think we have everything it takes, um, not only, of course, on the gender side, but then all the technologies, all the different regions, and I think that's really great to have such a um, wide spectrum of innovation and technology in Europe. Thanks a lot. 
Sylvain? Yeah, I would build on that. Um, Europe, as you know, is such a blend of cultures uh, that often startups are just immediately pushed into uh, attacking a global market instead of just focusing on a domestic one. And I think that's a tremendous advantage because focusing just on your domestic one, even in the US, exposes you to too much uh, you know, cyclical pressures that we now see are not playing very well. Thanks a lot. May? Uh, I'd say that in Europe we got a lot of support. I think in, in the US you get a, a lot of money for innovation. <laughs> in Europe you get a lot of support. The perspective of large corporate. Yeah, deep tech. I would say deep tech is a, um, a special emphasis in Europe, which is not so much uh, the emphasis in other regions where it's more software-driven services and so on. If you look uh, at the energy sector, Europe is 20 years ahead of the USA. Unfortunately, we had set up a meeting for tomorrow at the National Lab of Energy and at Stanford, and they have canceled because they had a power outage since yesterday, and they don't know when they will be able to have the electricity. This is the reality in Silicon Valley. This is not something that I'm saying. This is just uh, an evidence that uh, people say a storm. We have had two meters of water in Venice some years ago, two meters, okay? And uh, without any second of outage, two meters of water. And uh, they had uh, 15 centimeters of water in Louisiana. During the last summer, they had one week of outage. So unfortunately, if you look at the digital, Silicon Valley is far advanced, but if you look at energy, this is Stone Age. So, let's, we start with uh, some strong statement, I think, on diversity, on uh, the support that you can receive, uh, on uh, all the characteristics of the innovation ecosystem. Let's imagine two seconds that you are in front of a US investor. And I'm starting, of course, with the, uh, with the startupers because this is your daily life. Um, what would be the key argument you will try to sell to them in order to invest, of course, in your company, but more globally in a European company? Who would like to start? Maybe Sylvan? Our company is building um, a logistic system based on long-range drones. Um, and in, or, in order to operate, we need to obtain licenses in every country around the world. I think, uh, especially now, uh, with the, the way the winds are blowing, it actually is much more advantageous to be a European company building this than an American one, because Europe is uh, quite a bit more neutral uh, worldwide. So that's our specific uh, you know, advantage. Jan. Um, another aspect I think that's great in Europe is the talent, and we have heard this a lot of times. Um, the talent, but then again, together with the, um, let's say, all the different countries and regions that we have. So we have offices actually in several countries in Europe, and we allow our people to move between the offices. And this is what they like, because they want to start a family, their wife needs a job as well, or their husband, depend on what it is. Um, and I think th this is really a very strong asset um, that we have the availability um, to provide really high-class jobs in, in uh, Europe and that we have the people to take those jobs at an affordable level. I think that's also um, worth uh, mentioning that um, I think if you just look at the cost structure um, for hiring and, and then also for paying um, the, the salaries in the end, Europe is, is really attractive and I think that's the key um, when it comes to building great teams that then develop the technology. So talents, me. So I'm going to give you a very pragmatic answer as a, as a startup. Uh, I Especially spend because you have also built a factory here in the US. Yes, yeah, so I spent the past five years trying to grow a very innovative company in France. And since six months, I've been doing the same in the US. So a very stark uh, <laughs> comparison. Uh, and I'll start by saying I love the US. I was born here and I <laughs> just moved my whole family here. But the game here is to showcase why Europe is interesting. Um, and so I think... You know, three things, three myths that have really been busted for me in the past six months are, um, 
first one around regulation. So a lot of people think about Europe as a place where you know people don't like change and it's hard to align 27 countries to change the regulation. Um, in my experience, uh, regulation has changed very fast to support innovation. Um, so for my industry, growing insects, in uh, 2017, the regulation changed, enabling insects in aquaculture, and that has enabled us to uh, scale our uh, operations, and, and the result now is that three of the largest insect producers in the world are based in Europe. Um, so Europe's actually we think about it as an old continent, but the European Commission is very young. It was founded in 93, and so uh, they, are, they are open to change, and they are open to changing regulation quite fast. Uh, this, the second point is uh, aligned with what was mentioned about uh, people uh, being cheap. So <laughs> as a, as a, if you want the innovation to survive, you need to be competitive. And uh, there's great talent in the US, obviously. There's great talent in Europe. But... Um, the second myth is that it's more expensive to hire people in Europe, and it's simply not true. Uh, people in the US cost me twice as much as they do in Europe, uh, and they just don't have big student debts to pay. Uh, and so actually, it, it, you, can, you can hire people both at the operation level and at the qualified level for, for a lot cheaper than you can in, in, in the US. And uh, the, the third myth that I want to address um, is, is around money. So uh, in the US, it's fine to talk about money. <laughs> and uh, there is a, a, a misconception that it, it's hard to find funds in Europe for innovation. Uh, we've benefited from... Uh, you know, the tools from the EIC, and we got about 7 million early on uh, through both the European Commission, but also local grants. And that was really instrumental to uh, build a demonstrator, proof, uh, proof of concept, and now we've raised more than uh, 450 million from private investors. So there, there is money to support innovation in Europe. So uh, I think that these are kind of the, the three myths that I wanted to address today. Thank you very much. Before I, I move to, uh, to our colleagues from NL and Volkswagen, regulation was also key for you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on that. There's, a, uh, again, a narrative violation, clearly, we, um, we, with people's perception of uh, the level of regulation be in Europe being higher. It's actually, um, or, or slower, we are the world's first licensed uh, cargo drone airline precisely because the EU took the lead in implementing these uh, you know, common drone regulations, whereas uh, in, in the US uh, it's, it's still not possible to do uh, things the way that Europe does, uh, unfortunately. So, very clear. And um, I, I would also second the other two points about uh, talent uh, and, 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 support. And, and support. And financial support. Yeah. Volkswagen, uh, I mean, what are the, uh, your, your views regarding what is attractive uh, for startups or for US investors in Europe? I mean, I think that you have also there some, uh, some key, key points you would like to, to address. Yeah, well, of course, uh, we <laughs> today learned already uh, about the excellent and outstanding European initiatives and program and funding policy. We have learned about uh, the excellent and outstanding academia and uh, talent uh, source. But we have the big, big industry to support startups, to assemble value chains, to, to um, provide a universe for collaboration and to, to be hungry for innovation in NL. So I think that is, there is a biased vision, Europe and United States. Let's look at NL. We are the largest producer of renewables in the world. We are the largest one in United States, in South America, in, Euro, in, in Italy. Uh, are we a European company? Yes. Are we a US company? Yes. yes. Uh, um, let's look at the talents. I have heard we must attract talents in Europe. Uh, we have 60,000 people as employees. We have 500,000 people working on our innovation. We have a community of 500 people from 107 countries. This is the website, openinnovability.com. We share the challenges. We collect ideas. More than 13,000 proposals in uh, the last six years. We involve startups from Israel, from Africa, from Northern Europe, from US. Uh, the bias is the talents must work for us. 
hired. It's a menace for the talents. They don't want to work in a big company. They want to do something for themselves. Would you work at Tenet? Probably no. <laughs> I agree, my friend. <laughs> Why? Why? This is a biased vision from my point of view. Attract talents, what does it mean? Should it work in my company? No, no, this is not a open innovation. We talk about open innovation and we want to hire people. This is a contradiction. This is an oxymoron. Uh, involving talents means that they will provide their ideas, their proposal, their projects to us. We will adopt them, we'll invest in projects, in products. We cooperate with them in our labs. We co-define products that are useful to lower our costs, to increase our revenues, to increase the safety of our people that is much more important than revenues and costs. And this is exactly what we want to do with the startupers, leverage their passion, their commitment, their willingness to give something of themselves to the humanity. This is not hiring people. And we have involved many startups from US, more than 150. At global level, we have launched more than 500 uh, 60 projects with startups scaling up at a global level, many of them. And to the investors, I could say many companies came to me with zero revenues. Now they are unicorns. And there is a long list on openingability.com that you can check with some videos that you can view, watch. And we want to create value for us. We want to create value for the startups. We want to create value for the world. That's why I'm not chief innovation officer. I'm chief innovability officer. That is a new word that we have invented makes it innovation and sustainability. We want to innovate to make a more sustainable company and a more sustainable world. Well, I can confirm that indeed uh, NL uh, is uh, very instrumental in uh, the way they are supporting startups, including, by the way, EIC startups. We had the opportunity uh, to organize what we are calling large corporate uh, days with NL, where we were bringing, in fact, a number of the EIC beneficiaries to the attention of NL in order to tackle some challenges. There, is, there was a, ph a philosopher, Italian philosopher, when people asked him, what's your country? He said, I'm part of the country of the smart people. <laughs> there is not residence. Are you from US? Are you from Italy? Are you from wherever? Uh, if you have in common passion, willingness to make things come true, you can be part of this revolution, the energy revolution that people call energy transition because they are scared by revolutions. But OK, uh, the energy revolution can come. It doesn't matter from where the ideas come. And this is not an Italian company or a French company that can do it. But I, I split the word into the Jedi and the Sith. The Jedi wants, the Jedi wants to really make this revolution happen. No? And the Sith want to block, to stop it. They deny the global warming, they deny all the stuff that the science has already demonstrated. And there are the lobbies and the money behind them. But it doesn't, we don't see any competitor if it's a Jedi. There is a huge space. Let's collaborate. Let's open our heart. Let's be humble and admit that the best people, the most talented ones, they are outside our country, our company, and that they can be part of this revolution, not being hired, but just simply adopting their solutions, working with them, and having the financial uh, players as a potential support to make this revolution come true and getting their capital gains. From our side, we don't invest in startups. So we are not competitors of venture capital funds. We are allies. And when a, a very important venture capital fund came to me some years ago, uh, the name was True North. Probably you know them. They came to me. They had already invested $26 million of dollars in a company. And in half an hour, our, our tech people have demonstrated to the CTO of the company and to the uh, partner that that technology had no hope. And they had already invested 26 million. They were a little bit disappointed. But uh, I say, OK, why are you angry with me? You could come to me before <laughs> investing. No, That's why now we collaborate with more than 100 funds around the world. They, came to us, they come to us. They share the, what they want to do, which, which startups they want to work. And we make the industrial due diligence for free. And we help them. 
to better invest their money. Interesting experience. Uh, Nikolai, in, uh, in Volkswagen, what type of uh, actions are you taking to collaborate with uh, European startups? At first, um, we invite them to uh, to do common uh, POCs with us. So we support them uh, at first not uh, to govern them, not to uh, claim any um, exclusivity claims. Uh, this is uh, to keep them being startups. That's very important. But then to help them understanding the industrial needs, uh, to understand um, which kind of um, parts of the value chain should be added to make it uh, a bigger success, and uh, in which direction they should uh, do the invention in, in order to, to be the best scale-up partner for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would be also, in, in many cases, uh, lucky to also invite even competitors of us uh, to also um, look at these startups because uh, if there's a, a broader customer base for the startup, it is more successful, which is also um, uh, of a benefit for us. And uh, in many cases, we, or not in many cases, but uh, if it is worthwhile, we also invest, of course, in those startups. Thanks a lot. I'm turning again to the to the startupers. Uh, uh, you have benefited from EU support, uh, but also from national support, of course. Um, what was the characteristic of this kind of support? I mean, in terms of, for example, because the three of you have benefited from investments, which has the characteristic in particular to be non-dilutive. Uh, what did you learn from it? I mean, what was the positive aspect of this kind of support? <laughs> so we I start, start with you. Okay, I can I can start. I mean, one one thing that of course is great in Europe is this um, early stage support on the grant side, the non-dilutive side. Um, and what I like especially about it is the collaborative nature that it brings into the game. So usually in these projects, we partner up with universities, sometimes with corporates or, or other startups, and we work on a certain project together. Um, and this collaboration, um, I think it's really fruitful um, in the end because it's an innovative process where many people with different backgrounds uh, come together. And I think this helps us then also uh, from a European perspective uh, where we don't have so many big tech giants anymore. Um, this helps us to kind of um, bundle together and to be a, a strong unit together and then still bring up all of those solutions which then will have a huge impact um, in the future. So I think that's really um, an aspect that's often not seen in these um, um, kind of grant project. It's not only about the finance, and of course it's great to have the financial support, but it's really that it forces you to create a project plan for something together with others and then work on this and, and really achieve the milestones. Thanks a lot. Dvinen. Yeah, so <clears throat> we, we've been beneficiaries, uh, even actually from day one, because uh, our first investor, uh, Eleven uh, Capital, they were uh, they started out as an accelerator, uh, backed 100% by the EIF. So essentially, it was uh, a very interesting experiment that the EIF ran back in the 2010-2016 um, in Bulgaria. Um, and so our first investment came through through that. And as we heard yesterday. The EIF uh, and the Euro European Investment Bank essentially are uh, partners in limited partners in close to 80% of the funds in Europe. So I think that's quite quite unique. And uh, lately, we've been um, um, a few months ago, we were uh, we became beneficiaries of the EIC accelerator. So again, a grant component of about two and a half million euros, uh, as well as a commitment to our uh, upcoming Series A to invest a further amount um, in, in, as equity. Me. Um, I, I'd say, uh, of course, funds coming early on are always helpful uh, as a stepping stone. But the, the second thing that it brought to us was a lot of credibility. Um, so it's a, it's a thorough process to a go. Uh, yeah, a label. And, and just people know these are competitive programs and that there's a very serious review process. And so getting selected is a proof of uh, how 
you know, solid your business case is and, and, and how much potential your idea has. And you experience it in convincing other investors because you, you had this kind of support? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So we communicated very broadly about <laughs> getting the grants on all social media, but also um, when we went to see investors, we, 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 we shared with them the fact that we had received these grants and this was something that was a, a mark of uh, how credible our, our company was. Um, so I think that was also very useful. Thanks a lot. An interesting point for, for you also, Mark, on the KPIs that we have <laughs> in the future. Um, so we are in Silicon Valley. I mean, you have, I mean, Silicon Valley continues to appear as a, as a model, especially for a number of, uh, of investment, for, especially for scaling up. Certainly, there are a number of things that could be learned from, from the Silicon Valley and that could be also helpful in the uh, European innovation ecosystem. What kind of, uh, of uh, specificities that you can find here could, according to you, be also uh, transferred? I would not say replicate, because replicate is not necessarily the right word, but inspiring for us. Maybe, Nikolai, you would yeah. like to say something there, about There is something very important to learn, especially for, for large corporate like, like us, uh, who are used to plan, to do business case, and to straightforward uh, act until an SOP, and it has to work everything. But we have to learn to fail. This is something which um, is uh, uh, crucial um, in, in in, in terms of innovation, and uh, when we collaborate with startups, uh, we don't, we should not, we must not um, uh, postulate that it has to work, it has to be mature, and it has to function. So we have to try, we have to fail. To take risk and to accept to fail and to learn from failure. Ernesto. I could say that I fully agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, it's true, because uh, our ratio. Uh, our ratio is that uh, we do a successful project on four that we try. And I'm always angry with my colleagues because they don't risk enough. Because one that is winning on four, it means that we don't try to do amazing things. That's not why disruptive. Yes, not disruptive. That's why we had other projects that we identify with other methodology and we try and fail more. And, uh, but, okay. I don't want to be, how could I say, not poli politically correct, but one of the things that we could imitate in Europe is the Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, uh, people, <laughs> people think that uh, I'm crazy. I like this disruption. Uh, but, uh, but, no, no, this is true because, okay, we talk about failure, we talk about the culture of failure, and after if I mention Silicon Valley Bank, everybody smiles because they fail. But this is, doesn't mean that because we subtly, we, we consider failure as something that we must avoid. That's why we smile, we laugh, and we think that I'm crazy. I'm crazy not because I'm mentioning the Silicon Valley Bank, but they had a bank that was focused on startups, that has dedicated tools, innovating in finance, not with junk bonds or similar mm -hmm. bad stuff, but with specific tools that could be useful for startups, that have, have been useful for Google, Amazon, Salesforce, and many of them. So why don't we get the plus of this business model? And they have bad um, regu regulation uh, on the financial uh, sector, and this bank was even out of this regulation. This is clear, because they had the permits to be out of this. And the, the, the rules in Europe are definitely much better, the rules. So I think that Europe is much better. The financial system of, of Europe is much better. But we have not uh, specific banks that could make the same job of the Silicon Valley Bank. So we could imitate this. And moreover, I think that the Silicon Valley has not been created by Hewlett and Packard or other tech people. From my point of view, has been created more by Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Allen Ginsberg. The B generation, I have, I have had the honor of having a, a poetical reading 
with both of them because I'm a poet too. Some years ago, they came to, to, to Milan and we had a poetic, poetic reading together. And I have been much more inspired by them than by other investors. The willingness to challenge the status quo, the willingness to protest, even the other ones consider the Vietnam War okay. They have created the rebels in the 1968. They have created the willingness to say no to the power. They have created the love for freedom that attracted the talents. The talents have, are not attracted by money. You think that if you pay a talent, you can get whatever you want from this talent. That's why you have great resignation. But talents are attracted by a country, an area in, in, in which they can express their talent. They can test what their dreams. They can even fail and they can restart again with the same passion, the same willingness, and the same failure tolerant culture that allowed them to express themselves. And it came from the cultural revolution that happened here. So I have great hope for Europe because Europe has cultural roots that are definitely much more interesting rather than the US roots. And US is definitely much more structured to scale the business models up. This is exactly what we must uh, what we must copy, what we must adopt in Europe. Inspire we, from. We, yes, mm -hmm. the Starbucks business model has been inspired by a bar in Milan. But you have wonderful bars, but you are not any standard that has been scaled up of a, an Italian bar. So It's true. If I can piggyback on that, um, I, one thing that I think that's really inspiring here is the vision that startups have and how big it is. So if you look at the uh, largest company in Europe, you take the top 10, they've been the same for 60 years. If you take the top 10 largest company in the US, they didn't exist uh, 20 years ago, not a single one. And so European companies that like start up, they grow to a certain size and then they sell to a large company. And it's a shame because they could become the largest company of tomorrow. And so one thing I think that's really inspiring from here and that we should bring to Europe is startups don't sell, <laughs> just keep growing, keep pushing and, and keep disrupting. Not immediate exit. <laughs> uh, you would like to add something, Jan? Yeah, maybe combining the two points of failure and uh, adapting it and, and scaling. Um, I think it's important, of course, for startups to sell something. And then the question is, who are the first buyers? And um, I think what is happening here much more than in Europe is actually taking risk on the procurement side, Absolutely. especially on the public procurement side. So I think Europe can also get inspired here, take risk and, and risk to fail. Um, if you look at the, let's say, space um, industry, and, and how <laughs> procurement works there. Still, they put conditions in there, which basically makes it impossible for any space startup to, to sell because they don't exist for 10 years with hundreds of millions um, in, in revenue and all of this. So I think this is something we can um, also a little bit, uh, I guess, do better in Europe is just take the risk on the procurement side, help startups scaling through selling, and, and then maybe we come to a situation where they don't have to sell anymore the, the startups and they can grow to become the biggest companies on this planet. No, thanks a lot for, for this remark. I mean, uh, I'm looking also at our chair in the IC uh, board. I mean, this is one of uh, the novelties that we will launch uh, soon, the idea to test some EIC, uh, I would not say public procurement, but innovative procurement, just to test for some of uh, the beneficiaries of the EIC. I mean, the idea of our first validation via our first uh, contract, which is certainly something absolutely uh, vital in order to demonstrate that a new product, a new technology can make the, the trick. I see that somebody would like to intervene in the audience. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I'm going to do something very strange for an American speaking to Europeans. I'd like to introduce some nuance <laughs> in the conversation. So uh, I'm Nicholas Brigham and I lead a, uh, a firm that creates pro-social good technologies. Um, and we are actually working in Europe because Europe is a better place uh, in, 
in the regulatory environment is better in Europe. So I think there's a, there's a little bit of a, a sense we want to say regulation is bad, but actually regulation can create a lot of opportunities for innovation. And it's happening right now in the space of social media technologies and in pro-social technologies in general. Um, with the Digital Services Act, uh, the EU and, and its member states are saying there is a standard of quality and care that um, tech companies need to meet when they create products for our citizens. In the US, apparently we don't care about that. Um, <laughs> but there are firms like mine that care about that and we wanna provide tools directly to the citizens and the users of these different platform technologies. And we're launching it in Europe because that's the environment is, that is going to support that. So let's just think about the possibility that regulation can actually create very fertile ground for innovation for a lot of startups that otherwise get blocked or stiff-armed in, and that those are American football references, by the way, <laughs> blocked or <laughs> stiff-armed in the American context. Thanks, thanks a lot. I think it's very important what you said uh, on the positive aspects of regulation, because sometimes we are always putting a, an equal uh, sign uh, with uh, complexity with regulation, while regulation indeed can also provide security and insurance at a certain extent. And many thanks for, for this intervention. I, I'm turning again to the, to the panelists, uh, because I mean, in various uh, session today, but also uh, yesterday, uh, we mentioned that in Europe we have a uh, vision of innovation for a specific purpose. I mean, the idea of innovation for good. So towards uh, the achievement of uh, sustainable development goals, towards uh, ensuring the transition, uh, the green transition, and uh, or tackling specific uh, issues that we may have in our societies. Um, is it something in your companies or more globally in the world of uh, of uh, young entrepreneurs uh, in the startup world, but also in the large corporate world, uh, that you feel that is make is what it is also a characteristic of Europe in a, in a broader term. May uh, yes, absolutely. I think both um, with the. Uh, partners we've had in large corporates. Uh, the, the European leaders were visionaries and they have ambitious carbon targets and they're looking at us to help them solve them. Uh, but also the regulation is very much going in, in helping us. You know, sometimes new solutions are not as competitive or cost competitive. Uh, and so regulation can help kind of adjust that. And I definitely feel like in Europe, uh, there is that type of, uh, of regulation. So I, I, I do think innovation is uh, very much focused on innovation for good in Europe. Nikolai, maybe? Well, on, on behalf of the corporate, um, I think it's a global trend that uh, ESG and SDG has become a very relevant KPI for, for, for financial valuation of, of any uh, entity. So it uh, has risen to a, a very relevant uh, KPI. Um, well, in terms of uh, automotive industry, where I'm coming from, um, of course, the CO2 footprint um, and the footprint, social footprint as well, and, 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 and other uh, topics like resource um, consumption uh, has become really, really important. And um, if we wouldn't uh, uh, care for those topics, uh, we would endanger our business for the future um, uh, heavily. And this is understood. And uh, it is supported also by regulation and this is something which is very important which we really appreciate because it generates fairness uh, in terms of compet 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 competition uh, among uh, uh, the industry in order to um, be able to invest in those topics in uh, without having a disadvantage uh, against the other competitors and uh, so this is a, a very uh, as you told a very fertile um, uh, soil to grow up uh, these um, um, green investments and, and 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 of course doing good is something which is important for us to to maintain uh, a sustainable long term profitability uh, if you want to compare europe with us uh, you could use a famous dialogue from pulp fiction written by a genius, an American genius, 
uh, and Quentin Tarantino. He, he was from Italy. And uh, okay, and uh, it's crazy enough. And in this dialogue that is memorable from my point of view, uh, they are talking, John Travolta and the other one, uh, and they say, uh, what is the difference between Europe and US? And John Travolta said, there are some small differences. There are little differences that create another world. And he says, do you know how they call quarter pounder with cheese? Quarter pounder with cheese? No, no, I don't know. How do they call? Royale with cheese. <laughs> Royale with cheese. There is poetry in Royale with cheese. <laughs> quarter pound is just the weight. Straight to the point. This is typically American. And it's standard. It's a standard. Wherever you go, quarter pounder is quarter pounder, but Royale. Yes. There is beauty in Royale. And they say, okay, what, what, what do they do? Uh, they, use, they use ketchup with fries? No. They call French fries. And they use <laughs> mayo. They use mayo. How could it be possible that they use mayo? And they, uh, they don't understand how could it be possible that they use in Amsterdam mayo. And that also the ash is, is, is free. Okay, but uh, it's available. But uh, why I'm quoting this? Because this is a great analysis that describes the difference between US and Europe. In Europe, you have a, an attitude to the beauty, an attitude to the diversity. There is a strong culture on the beauty. If you are a, a company in the fashion industry, you should relocate immediately to Europe. You should hire talents, in this case, hire. And <laughs> uh, why? Because we, are, we face the beauty every day in our cities. What do you see in, in every uh, US city standards? It doesn't matter if you are in northern or in southern, eastern or western coast. Wherever you go, you have a commercial area with the same Starbucks, Starbucks the same of, uh, um, commercial uh, shops, and the same standards that have been replicated. This is something that we can learn from. Because we are not able to create a standard and to scale it up. This is something that we miss. Your because our brain, <laughs> our brain is not exposed to standard. I have worked with many scientists, neural scientists, trying to understand why people have such behaviors. Why people have such behaviors in the business. If you don't consider culture behind it, if you don't consider how the brains are nurtured, exposed, since you were young, you cannot consider why people have some behaviors. The, we are exposed to the diversity. They are exposed here to the standards. Jan, you would like to add something? Well, I don't know how I can add my <laughs> Pulp Fiction story, but... <laughs> I will but, do your cold quarter pounder with cheese. <laughs> no, but maybe some other point you mentioned earlier about being a, a member of, what did you say, the, the country of the smart people or something. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you're coming back to the workforce and the talent, actually, if you look at the generation Z that is upcoming, I mean, the, the way um, they get motivated is, of course, they, um, everyone needs a, a certain income, but that's not really what motivates them, but it's the purpose, right? It's kind of what impact they have and um, I think this is very um, important. We, when we started the com our company, uh, we created a mission statement like you have to do in, a, in the startup world. Um, and our mission statement says, we build quantum computers for the well-being of humankind. And I didn't know when, when, when we did this how powerful this actually is. And, but still, when I talk to new employees and ask them, why did you join? Many quote actually this mission statement because they have this feeling they're doing something good. They're creating an impact. They're changing the world. And I think this is for, for all of us. It's important to realize that um, this generation um, that is now becoming the new generation um, and, and creating the new leaders, they think differently. So um, they think global. They don't think in nation states. They think in impact, and um, in, in this sense, I think it's very important to keep this in mind, and th I think this is a strength Europe has, because we pay attention to these details and these things, and I think this is something we could leverage much more. Okay. Vilen, one word about this? Only one. <laughs> Several are possible. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> You talked about um, sustainability and ESG earlier. Um, w w my brother and I, we started a company and uh, we were brought up in, you know, post-communist Bulgaria. There were a number of financial crises, 
bank runs were, you know, a lot more than just one here, um, and hyperinflation and all that. So we, this really stayed with us, um, and we, again, being mission oriented, uh, we we're a very mission driven company. But the mission really is just to do things that make sense. It doesn't make sense to to be dirty, to be polluting, to to be inefficient. So I think I see a lot of that uh, realism uh, a lot more in Europe. I studied in the U.S. I uh, I've lived here. I, I like I like it a lot. But um, there's definitely a difference, a more nuanced view of how uh, folks in Europe perceive what they can contribute to the world and how that impact could be measured. Thanks a lot. Is there, yes. Um, <clears throat> Hi, I work for a, a European uh, scale-up. Um, we've created a uh, transformative technology and underwater uh, subsea Wi-Fi to move data across water. Uh, we've been wonderfully supported by EIT uh, and its affiliates to get us to uh, um, the scale-up phase. Um, we do climate change tech, uh, we do um, technology, really, that is deep tech in terms of getting that data out in the ocean, which is critical for climate change and, and everything else. And sustainability, what you mentioned, uh, of course. Um, the question for uh, the panel, really, is where do, would you turn in terms of Europe? Um, we're a European uh, startup, a female founder, uh, all the sort of the box is have been ticked. We have 68,000 kilometers of coastline in, in Europe alone, right? Um, and uh, by the way, regulation is good. In sustainability, self-regulation doesn't work for industry. It's critical that we have regulation. I mean, in December, the EU launched a noise pollution underwater. Completely builds a new ecosystem of um, innovation. Uh, but the key part is we should be a darling of Europe, essentially, right? How do we scale from a small organization and grow? How can they, and why uh, do we have to come to the U.S. to do that? Who would like to say a word? I, I, I would say a word myself, but who would like to say a word uh, in the panelists? Have you spoken to salmon producers? Because <laughs> <laughs> they've been chewing my ear about this for years. They want Wi-Fi underwater, so <laughs> they, they'll help you. <laughs> Somebody else? Woody Allen said the, the answer is yes. What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> you would like to say something? No. Um, I, I do believe that uh, uh, in I mean it's obvious that in order to to grow up I mean you have to internationalize I mean this is obvious um, in Europe in reality I mean with the various actions that we are taking and I to, I'm sure that you have understood that uh, a number of them are coming that are addressing some more of your issues I mean we would like really to create uh, our objective of a real single market that could help us to compete with the US. I mean, this year was the 30th anniversary of the single market in Europe. Uh, and when you compare the situation 30 years ago to the, to the situation of today, you can see that on a number of things, I mean, we have achieved single market. We still have a number of barriers. Uh, and in this context, I mean, it's very clear that to provide the necessary funding to our companies, at various stage of their uh, growth is absolutely crucial. What we have started to do with the EIC, you have been supported by our brother or sister, which is the EIT, but I mean, we are working uh, hand in hand, is really to provide the necessary support at the very beginning of the, of the journey uh, with the necessary means in order to scale up where the, uh, the private sector is not yet ready to take the risk because either you are deep tech oriented or either the regulation is not yet ready because you are tackling something which is uh, really disruptive. Any reason and where necessary uh, you, you need to have the public funding taking the risk but with an approach allowing in fact to attract other investors which is in the DNA for example of the EIC. 
Then, I mean, it's very important to continue to provide support because uh, we were mentioning, I mean, uh, uh, Jan was mentioning the necessity, of, the necessity of the first contract, the validation in real term of uh, your technology. And, and this is something on which we are working and where we have already example of, uh, of uh, initiatives that are taken also at national level. What is nevertheless another key issue for us, uh, and I think it was addressed in one of the previous uh, session, is that I think that we have in Europe, EU level or national level, the necessary support from the very, very early stage to the end of the growth stage. But for the later stage, which is the moment where in fact you are turning to the internationalization, the world competition, we remain with some weaknesses. The, the, the rationale of the announcement made by the president of uh, the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in last September in the State of the Union speech to set up a sovereign tech fund is exactly for this reason. Because otherwise, I mean, the risk is that indeed, despite all this support that is provided up to the end of the growth stage, I mean, if there is no means for big tickets uh, that exist for a company like yours, I hope, uh, later on, I mean, they will look where the money is. And let's be clear, a part of the money is here. Uh, so, so this is what we are trying to build. And this is uh, what the Commission here announced also earlier uh, in the New European Innovation Agenda, where the support to this uh, uh, deep tech uh, sovereign fund is present in order to complement, in fact, the whole value chain. So, uh, but happy to, to continue the discussion uh, bilaterally on your, on your topic. We are coming to the, to the end of this session. I mean, it's, uh, the, the clock is running uh, very quickly. Um, I just would like to, um, to, to add my, my great panelists to, to conclude with a, a single sentence or a few words the way you want on what could be um, the key message you would like to pass to uh, an American entrepreneur or an American uh, investor to uh, have a look at Europe and to invest or to, uh, or to come, uh, or to come in, in Europe? If you had to, um, to, to, make z to, to share this kind of sentence with them, what would be the words or, or the sentence that you would like to, to share with them? May. I would say I'm definitely seeing a, a, a shift in dynamics and things are moving very fast at the moment and there's lots of startups. If I compare it to 10 years ago and there's uh, more funds and so I think um, I, I wouldn't rely on like old conceptions of what it's like to innovate in Europe. I would, I would, I would check it out because there's a lot happening. Thank you. Zvilin. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned in an earlier session, um, I, I found that my American friends often think of America as the whole world, and there's a huge world out there, especially in Europe. Um, if uh, a company like ours could become essentially several years ahead of the competition from a country that for 70 years uh, didn't have an aerospace uh, industry, and we did it for a fraction of the capital and a fraction of the team, uh, then there's no excuses you can't... Uh, do anything. I mean, there's no excuses for you to not go to Europe. One aspect maybe that hasn't been mentioned so much um, is that Europe, I guess, is also a bit more balanced. And if we talk about deep tech and we have long time horizons, five, seven, ten years, you don't want to be trapped in a, let's say, high or, or low because Silicon Valley Bank collapses or something. Uh, but you want to be able to move your business throughout all of these uh, waves. And I think Europe builds a, um, a great potential for this with, with very, let's say, long standing investments and patient being, capital. Yeah, patient capital yeah. Thank you. Ernesto. Let's invent in Europe, let's scale up in US. <laughs> I, I, and moreover, there is food and wine that is much better in Europe. <laughs> okay. Especially and, in Italy. Uh, uh, yeah. If you like the Italian food and the wine, you are invited to the event that we are going to, to, to manage at the Innovit. So all of you are invited. I give you just one reason, the Italian food. <laughs> That's what is for you, Nicola. Well, I would advise them that they have to be quick 
because uh, the European uh, st uh, startup um, community is not saturated as it is in uh, the US, at least as the capital is uh, concerned. So uh, the, it is still reasonable. There are good targets and um, they are good to, to, to be invested in, but it develops quickly. Thanks a lot. I think that they deserve your applaud. And this is concluding this session. Many, many thanks to all of you and Europe is open for any entrepreneurs and investors from the US. Thank you very much. Thank you for our final panel. That was incredible. Um, this is it. Thank you for attending the European Innovation Agora. Uh, I wrote down a couple takeaways personally, just because I've been inspired today. Working together, the EU and US can make global, they, you guys can make a global Silicon Valley. There's an opportunity being created right here. The EU, EU has a presence in Silicon Valley, and now the Valley can have a presence there. Universities are the hotbeds for talent and energy. Big challenges need to be solved globally, and students are the stakeholders. So harness their ambition to find the best of the best. Ecosystem collaboration is essential for all opportunities. Spain has really good wine. I just, I, I, I wrote this down. Okay, I, that was my takeaway from you. <laughs> it's time to invest in international partnerships and innovation cohesion. Companies founded by women solve more real world problems. So for the future, disrupt traditional investing, unlock potential, and invest in diversity. The EU is creating a supportive ecosystem for early startups thanks to the alliances made in this room today. Regulations can be fertile ground for uh, new entrepreneurs. And the Royale with cheese is poetry and an analog for EU industry. <laughs> so inspiration and innovation, they're not defined by borders, but by vision. So I would like to thank Commissioner Gabrielle, the EIT, and EIC. Thank you all and everyone for watching. And personally, I am walking away feeling a strong bond here. I'm Carrie Byron. And if any of you want to hit me up later, I'm also a female founder with a founder also in Amsterdam. Just saying. Vesters, here for you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>